1978, Haddonfield, Illinois, Halloween night. After discovering all of her friends' dead, mutilated corpses in the house across the street, and surviving a vicious attack from an escaped mental patient wearing a white mask, 17-year-old Laurie Strode looks up at Dr. Loomis and asks, What's the boogeyman? Loomis replies, As a matter of fact, that was. As a matter of fact, it was. And so begins one of the most successful franchises in slasher history. Over the last few weeks, we've introduced some of the key movies that worked as forerunners to the slasher subgenre, all introducing various elements of what we now know and love as the slasher. But it took one visionary director to hone all of these ideas and strip them back into one perfect scary movie. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of the slasher movie and review John Carpenter's monumental masterpiece, Halloween. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. Um, If you're joining us for the first time, then welcome. Please do subscribe on iTunes. Go back and listen to the previous five or six episodes that we've already got. They're all fantastic. Basically, we are currently in the middle of exploring the evolution of of the slasher. Previously, we've talked about all of the movies that kind of are generally considered the forerunners. So, Jallo, Psycho, Peeping Tom, Black Christmas, Alice Sweet Alice. Now we are hurtling into sort of peak slasher territory. Now, before we get into this week's show, don't forget you can email us anytime on evolutionofhorror at gmail.com or you can find us on Twitter at evolutionpods. I love hearing from you guys, love hearing your feedback, love hearing your points of view and your reviews on each film that we cover each week. So, please do get in touch whenever you like Um, and I'm going to do a little shout out to everyone who has given us an iTunes rating or review this week so here we go a big thank you to Ale.Maris to Big P 1234 to Fan of Lloyd or Fan of Floyd it's probably Fan of Floyd thank you to Fan of Floyd Um, thank you to Sneezes Like a Cat nice uh, to bff 2009 11 to clary dairy and to scary clary don't know if they're two different people and that's a coincidence or it's the same person twice uh, and a big thank you to ryan at tomlinson so thank you so much to everyone that left me a review this week if you want to leave us a review please please do and um, it kind of helps us get on those kind of itunes algorithms and things uh, and also it just means a lot to me to read your feedback so thank you so much i will give a similar shout out to anyone else next week who leaves us a review um, i also got a message from a, a listener called martin woolley who just wanted to give a quick shout out to his girlfriend eve who uh, discovered the podcast and introduced it to him so a big hello to eve and a big thank you to eve for spreading the love um, and equally if there's anyone else out there who has discovered the greatness of this podcast and wants to introduce it to their partner their mates their colleagues please do spread the word that is a big help to me you're sort of doing my job for me okay on to this week's show then so to discuss all things halloween tonight i'm joined by two incredible guests later on tonight i'm going to be joined by jacob stolworthy from the independent and we are going to dissect john carpenter's 1978 classic movie in depth from beginning to end that will be a spoilerific review but before that i'm going to have a little chat with somebody about halloween more broadly the whole franchise its legacy on horror and john carpenter and just the huge influence that he has had not just on horror but on cinema so to discuss with me all things Halloween and John Carpenter. I'm joined by somebody who is synonymous with one of the biggest movie publications in the world, Empire. It is my great pleasure to introduce the brilliant Chris Hewitt. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Mike. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? That was yeah, that was really artificial. That response. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I'm good. It was yeah. I've actually I got a Chris. Fine. I've got a Chris bot because you're so busy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've sent along. Yes, <laughs> I've built like, a Chris. It's like Luke Skywalker in Return of the Jedi. I've just sent you two droids instead of me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please accept them as my gift. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this because I know you are. You you must get asked to do. How many podcasts have you been asked to appear in? I I, I can imagine. It's... <laughs> Only the ones I invite myself. 
to. Um, uh, it's a fair amount, but yes. not as many as you think. But you know, I'm I'm always excited to uh, to bring my nonsense onto someone else's podcast. Just for people, I'm sure most people out there that are into movies or into movie podcasts probably know who you are. But just in uh, case, for people that case. For, for people that don't, tell us a little bit about you, what you do. Uh, okay, so I'm Chris Hewitt, and I'm uh, associate editor at Empire Magazine, which is the world's biggest selling movie magazine. Um, it is one of the few remaining movie magazines, but it we is. are the biggest selling. And uh, I am also the host of the Empire Podcast, which is one of the world's biggest movie podcasts, mm-hmm. maybe? I think it uh, is, yeah. Can I say that? I'm maybe apart sure. from that one other podcast that we won't we won't talk about. Yeah, but is that is that about movies or is that just later on about entertainment? <laughs> it's I, a it's a yeah, it's it's I swear I the percentage of movie talk goes yeah. less and less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, is it I mean Technically speaking, yes, Entertainment is a film podcast. So mm. yeah, okay, we'll give them that. And then there's loads of other great film podcasts as well. So I'm the host of the Empire Podcast, and uh, and I moonlight on other people's podcasts as a when I'm asked. It's awesome. I've got um, Helen O'Hara on this podcast as well in a yes. few weeks' time. So um, basically, I'm trying to recreate Empire, basically. I'm essentially making my own Empire podcast. That's, no, that's um, fine. I'm make, working my way through you all. You uh, get us wet, we can multiply it. <laughs> exactly. That's 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 my plan. In this podcast, we put, we're, we're all about horror. Um, what is your relationship like with horror? Never write, never call. Um, <laughs> you know, weirdly enough, since I got married... <laughs> um, since I got married, uh, my relationship with horror has taken a bit of a backseat because my wife... <laughs> hates horror films yes. and she refuses to watch horror films right. so I, I find it a lot harder to sit down and watch horror films than mm. I used to um, but I love horror mm. horror is uh, you know I'm not going to be cliche and say Star Wars but horror was kind of my passport to movies mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. because I, I started watching horror films when I shouldn't have been watching horror films as everyone um, does as everyone yeah. does as everyone does and uh, uh, and a lot of the directors that I truly 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 love are horror directors. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Carpenter is one of them. George yes. Romero is another one. Um, Sam Raimi. Yeah. You know, Evil Dead, who's my favorite film of all time. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I love horror. I, uh, unashamedly. Yeah, wonderful. What's the earliest horror movie you remember seeing as a kid? Do you remember, like, what your first horror movie was? Yeah, I mean, I go back and forth on this one a little bit. The first one I have a really, really, really vivid memory of watching was... Um, a film called Superstition. There is a superstition, and will anyone survive? I don't know if you've, you've seen it. It's like a 1982 oh, it does sound movie, familiar. maybe 1983. Very, mm. very, uh, very, very straight down. I revisited it a few years ago, and it actually it does still pack a punch. Mm. Um, it's a fairly generic haunted house witchy movie about a f- family that move into this old house and of course it's home to a witch centuries old witch and they reawaken the witch and she goes on a rampage uh, but it it fucked me up as a kid <laughs> uh, what's your opinion on horror movies now and does horror still scare you does horror still excite you I mean if you look at films like yeah. from this year like It Mother whatever else you yeah. know recently uh, so are we considering Mother to be a horror film well that's, another, the purposes of this that's another conversation altogether but yeah you know, for the purpose. I think of this. we can because I think Aronofsky, as much as I didn't like that film, yeah, I think he does really interesting things uh, technically, and uh, the way he keeps his camera really close to Jennifer Lawrence's face, yeah, so that the threat that's all around her, oh, it's... Uh, can come from any side. And some of his, some of the, some of his framing and some of his blocking, I thought was really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. The way that the way that you know things would enter the frame unbeknownst to Jennifer Lawrence, and we could see them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. was really interesting, and I, you know, I. You know, you could call it Black Swan a horror film in a, in, a, in a way, and I think you could call this a horror film in a way. And I really kind of want to see him properly do a horror film because yeah. I think I think he has, I think he has the chops. Um, yeah. You could even call Requiem for a Dream a bit of a horror film as you well. Could, you could, yeah. Know, just when she's being kind of stalked by her own fridge and all that kind of stuff, it's quite <laughs> it's quite fucked up as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You got, you really really could, but I'd, I'd like to see him properly do something in that genre. Yeah, yeah. And just you know really go to town on it. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a kind of a strange one because I know that we're meant to sit here and say that the golden age of horror was in the 1970s and mm. the 1980s, and and it was in many ways it was, yeah. and uh, you know the the films that came out then uh, endure for for a very good reason, yeah. and the directors I mentioned. Romero and Carpenter and John uh, John Craven, yeah. John Craven John and Craven. Wes Carpenter, <laughs> all the greats, all the greats <laughs> are greats for a reason, yeah. But when you go back and you watch 
early Romeros yeah. and you watch early um, Cravens yeah. and even early Cronenbergs, yeah. the filmmaking, in my opinion, I'm going to get slaughtered for this, is sometimes a little slip, sh- slip shot, yeah. a little ramshackle. It's a bit rough and ready, isn't a it? A little rough and ready, <laughs> a little thrown together, Yeah, technically not on a good level. Mm-hmm. The acting's not great. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would say that on a level of craft, yeah. I'm really going to get slaughtered for this, they're better than they used to be. Excuse me, Lori. Oh, Mr. Brackett, I'm sorry, Mr. Brackett. Oh, I didn't mean to startle you. That's all right. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? What I want to ask you about today is is uh, Halloween specifically, and also John Carpenter. Yeah. What's your earliest memory of watching Halloween? Do you remember? Wow. Yeah. Um. I must have. I. <laughs> I did an oral. Uh, lecture on it, and horror films mm. in English in GCSE mm-hmm. level. So I was either fourteen or fifteen. Yeah. So I went into class. This isn't the first time I watched it, but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm yeah. still, you're, you're, you're working you're, your way back. I'm having a sense memory here. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I went into class, and I had, I, I really worked in this thing. I worked on this, this, this presentation about we had to do an oral presentation, and I did this presentation about horror films and why I loved horror films and the great horror films mm-hmm. and these are the you know, and so I ended up I probably shouldn't have done this you know, I ended up showing clips from 18 rated films in school to kids <laughs> who were 15 years old brilliant and the teacher did bad an eyelid it was right. fine I, mean, I remember I literally showed like the end of I, I showed the end of Halloween mm. and that was one of the things I went this is one of the great endings in horror I don't don't think I had a point necessarily <laughs> but I just went this is one of the great endings in horror films yeah, you yeah, should yeah. love horror films and so I, I showed you know what's the boogeyman as a matter of fact that was at the end of at the end of Halloween, mm. so I obviously knew the film well enough at that point to choose the ending. Yeah, to show uh, to a bunch of fifteen-year-olds. <laughs> so the first memory I have of watching Halloween is probably around twelve or thirteen, and I always remember the cover. The cover is evocative for me. Mm-hmm. You know, the night the he kind of, came home and the sort of pumpkin thing with the, the pump, knife. Yeah, that, the turns yeah. of the knife. Yeah, and it's one of those things because you know. The, I don't think it's gonna. I'm gonna sound so fucking old in this thing. Uh, but you would go into video stores as a kid, yeah, like ten, eleven, twelve years old, whatever, and I would just be transfixed by the the horror Me covers yeah, and yeah, yeah. the posters on the wall, and 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 kids growing up these days are never going to have that experience. You're never going to have that experience of walking into somewhere and looking at a poster for um, Dead and Buried, mm-hmm. which is the, the woman lying on her back with her throat slit mm-hmm. and going, what the fuck is that movie? Yes. I need to see this movie. What yes. is that? Or Squirm, yeah. the Killer Worms movie, and yep. looking at that poster, which is it's a shot that is not in the movie, yep. which is a woman being attacked in the shower by Killer Worms. And, and I remember also being transfixed by the cover for Halloween. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it kind of, ooh, what is it? I'm not entirely sure. I don't mm. want to yeah, see it that. reveals very little yeah. as well, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. I, I, I don't really have a definitive answer for you, Mike. I'm sorry. But no, no, no. I think I even watched... I think I was watching Friday the 13th movie before I watched yeah. Halloween, which is interesting because obviously then I watched the the, <laughs> the the cheap copy before I watched the original. Yeah. Uh, first thing I should probably ask you is, are you a fan of Halloween then? You- I love Halloween. Yeah. I think it's uh, an amazing film, but I'm, I'm a huge John Carpenter fan. W- most people I've asked on this podcast, what's your favourite horror movie or what's your favourite slasher movie particularly? Mm-hmm. They will always cite Halloween. It always tops the list. You know, yeah. Why do you think that is? Uh, it, well, obviously, it's, it's a primal thing. It's a mm-hmm. movie that really gets into the fear of, of, of what's out there, the fear of being alone, yeah, yeah. the fear of the unknown. Uh, I think anyone who's ever spent an evening uh, at home alone and they hear a noise outside, and you know, you can easily imagine that would be Michael Myers. It, mm. it gets you on a on a really primal level. Michael Myers is another reason why it's such a huge hit. Um, he's uh, such a memorable character within horror, and I'm kind of a little sad about what they did to that character over yes. over time. Um, uh, and he's such an iconic figure. And mm. he's such an interesting character in the way that I don't think, as much as I love Jason Voorhees, I'm wearing a Jason Voorhees t-shirt, I've just realised. <gasps> oh my God, um, you are. <laughs> Brilliant. I didn't, I didn't deliberately do this. It was literally <laughs> the, the, the first thing that came to mind this morning. Fantastic. Uh, but yeah, this is all his victims, the names of all his victims. 
That's yeah, amazing. Really so basically, it's a it's a Jason hockey mask, yeah. but the white of the mask is all small writing of. So it's the name of every single victim, every single person he killed. That is brilliant. Uh, making up the the Jason hockey mask, and I was at yesterday. I was at. I was in Leeds at Thought Bubble, the comic book art festival, mm-hmm. and it was an amazing Jason Voorhees cosplay mm. guy uh, who did this incredible thing where he would he he walked into this this it was held the city center. He walked uh, out of uh, a building, had a harpoon. So I think he might have been Jason from Jason from Friday the Thirteenth Part Eight, possibly. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe. Mm-hmm. And uh, he saw me looking at him. I was about 50 yards away. And he mm-hmm. saw me and he just stopped and stared at me for about two minutes. And we just stared at each other. <laughs> and it was, it, he's had the build. I'm not entirely sure he wasn't actually chasing for he's he just well out there. You know, but I just decided to walk away. <laughs> just look over my shoulder just in case he's coming after me. Um, I was stood at the urinal next to Kane Hodder at Fright Fest this year. No so way. That was a surreal experience. No as well. way. <laughs> yeah. Wow. There he is. Does, Kane I imagine there's a man who has to stand yeah, oh, quite well a way back, back from well the. Back. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just uh, had that feeling. I had that feeling. Yeah, yeah. Bloody hell, that's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scary looking guy. Kane Scary Hodder. looking guy. You wouldn't mess with him. Yeah. Um, but I, I love Jason, but I think Michael is the purest uh, distillation of, of yeah. evil in that slasher type character. You know, there's that speech that Loomis has about, you know, the, yes. the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. Uh, I think Michael Myers really, uh, really captures that. Uh, but I, I think there's more, there's more to it than, than that. I think, you know, Carpenter is, his command of, of, of tone and mood in the film is amazing. It's got this lovely, somber edge as mm. well. I mean, I'm, you know, we could talk all day about how Carpenter frames this movie and oh, how he shoots yeah. this movie with, with Dean Cundey and, uh, it's 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 actually a thing of beauty. Uh, well, let's move on to John Carpenter then, uh, uh, just more broadly as a director. I mean, just for people that don't know or may not be as familiar with his films as we are, I mean, tell us a little bit about Carpenter, his style, his technique. I mean, what kind of summarizes Carpenter as a director? Would you say Carpenter is a really stylish, stylish director. Uh, he he frames brilliantly. He's very yes. meticulous with his camera work. His compositions are great. Obviously, uh, John Carpenter, the music is such a huge part of his movies as yeah. well that he does himself for the most part. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but he also has this thing about groups of people coming together. And this is a very Howard Hawksian thing. He's, mm-hmm. you know, John Carpenter has said many, many times over the years that most of his movies are remakes of Rio Bravo. And mm-hmm. he has this thing about groups of people, ordinary people coming together to face down, not always successfully, uh, an unknown and greater evil mm-hmm. and that is a th- theme that recurs constantly throughout his work it c- recurs in, in The Thing it recurs in Prince of Darkness it recurs in um, you could even say Escape from New York yeah, yeah. Um, and it especially happens in The Fog where a group of people come together to face against this 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 terrifying threat Yeah. but Carpenter's movies are elegant for me mm-hmm. and we're, you know, when I said earlier on about the great horror directors of the 70s and 80s perhaps being a little rough and ready with their filmmaking. You don't get any of that in Carpenter. No. I would say from Assault and Precinct 13 onwards. I think Dark Star is a little rough and ready it's around the film, edges. Like, it's yeah. really, really fun. It's great. It's a great film. <clears throat> um, and it's a hell of a starting point. But from Assault and Precinct 13, what you have, and there's a film about a group of characters come together to face yeah. unknown evil. Um what you have from that is a character who's a director who's completely in command of the frame mm. and completely in command of all aspects of what he's doing, uh, performances and music and, and sound going together. Um, from that run, that from Assault and Precinct 13 onwards until probably, I would say, Prince of Darkness. Yeah. That's a run for me that is as good as anything in modern American cinema. <laughs> You know, he's not like Sam Raimi. He's not like someone who calls attention to himself, no. particularly as a, as a stylist. But you can pretty much look at, you know, any frame of Halloween or any frame of The Fog, and you can see the same director. Yes, very, very much so, and someone who definitely influences other directors down the line. It seems like he his style as well is kind of 
stripped down in a way as well which is so yeah. nice you know like it's the same with the music whether it's just sort of two piano notes or whatever and everything is and yeah, usually his stories fair. tend to be very simple it's like a a lovely kind of setup usually that you could summarize in about two sentences for most of his films as well oh, which God, i yeah. love as well there's incredible confidence about him as well yes and the, the interesting thing about him is that he's known for doing halloween and he's known for the fog and those movies are some of the greatest um, jump scares mm-hmm. in the history of cinema. But mm-hmm. he's not someone who is uh, reliant upon that. No. Uh, he's really, really great at conjuring mood. And he's really, really great at unsettling the viewer. And there are moments, because we as a viewer know in Halloween that Michael Myers is around. We know that Michael Myers is is a bad egg. Yes. <laughs> which, which I think is how Loomis describes him. <laughs> the, the, devil's blackest egg. Egg. the blackest egg. The blackest egg. The rotten egg. Because <laughs> we know he's 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 around. Carpenter is really, really great at positioning Michael Myers in the frame, yes. in the corner of the frame, and establishing him there as a threat yes. and uh, uh, appearing to Laurie and then disappearing and, and just gradually unsettling uh, her and us. And he's really regretted that. And he, he's there's wonderful moments as well in The Fog. There's that great moment where Jamie Lee Curtis's character is in the, uh, the, the morgue Mm-hmm. And the the sailor is reanimated briefly and yes. starts stalking towards her. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Just the moments like that. It's not a jump scare. It's but it's utterly terrifying. Yeah, and he was yeah, great yeah, yeah. at just invoking a sense of of dread because that's what Michael Myers is. Ultimately, at the end of the day, he is also he is death. Mm-hmm. He is the inevitability of death. He's the inevitability of evil in yeah. a way, and uh, he's going to come for you. And uh, you know, he is the boogeyman, and he's going to get you no matter what happens. So I've got to ask you then, what is your favourite John Carpenter movie? Because actually, for me, I've got to confess, it's probably not Halloween. It's probably The Thing. Clear! Clear. Would you agree, do you yeah, think? Yeah, The Thing is the thing is one of my all-time top ten. You know, my top ten shifts constantly, but The Thing, yeah. the thing is going to be pretty much always on there, along with Evil Dead 2. Yeah. And... Um, I just adore that movie and I had the pleasure of, of interviewing Carpenter about it um, a couple of times actually uh, where we reunited him and Kurt Russell a couple of years ago Brilliant. Uh, for a, a, a shoot and an amazing interview in, in Empire and then recently because the 35th anniversary is coming up to the thing yeah. it's coming out in Steelbook I know the 4K and, uh, a 4K Steelbook yeah. so I interviewed Carpenter about it um, recently and um, you know he's he's I've interviewed Carpenter a number of times over the years and he's uh, a very interesting guy uh, he's not particularly a fan, I would say, of the interview process. No. Uh, he's probably been asked every single question uh, a hundred times. Of course. But um, I actually quite enjoy sparring with him a little bit. It's it's quite fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was... I really enjoyed this one. There, yeah, it is, This was a fun interview, and that's going to be... Can I plug? Can Absolutely. I plug? It's going to be in the new issue of Empire. We, is we, it? Yeah, what, so. with Carpenter? Yeah. Ah, oh, amazing. Exciting. Amazing. Exciting. Very exciting. Does he reveal anything about next year's David Gordon Green Halloween? No, he didn't. No, no I no. was focused very much on the thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. But, hey, honestly, I'm intrigued to see what they're going to do with that movie. Yeah. And, uh, but, but, yeah, but, but going back to your original question, yes. Uh, if I were to do a top five Carpenter completely off the top of my head. Yeah, go on. Go on. Completely off the top of my head, so don't kill me if I yeah. get this wrong. So the thing. Yeah. Then the Halloween. Then the Halloween. That's how well I know that film. The Halloween. (laughs) Uh, Prince of Darkness. Yes. In fact, I'm wavering on Prince of Darkness because I love that film. I'm in agreement so far. Then The Fog. Mm -hmm. And then Assault and Precinct 13. Yeah. So, sorry. I'd Uh, maybe replace The Fog with Christine, and other than that, I'd have the same I love Christine. Yeah, yeah. I love Christine. Yeah. So I'm going to have six films in my top five. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm right there with you. I shot him six times. I shot him in the heart. The man, he's not human. Okay, well, let's go back to the Halloween franchise now, because I'm interested to hear what you think of all of the other Halloween movies that John Carpenter himself didn't direct. I mean, it go, I think we've got, <laughs> what have we got, about eight sequels altogether? There's, oh, there's eight Halloween movies. Yeah, there We're is, about to have a ninth. Is that right? Eight Halloween? Yeah, yeah. I suppose. And then you've Halloween got the Rob Zombies as well. You've got the two. I, I don't. <laughs> that was going to be my next question about that. I'm not. But, but yeah, okay. No, they don't exist. They don't exist. As far yeah, as I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just... 
and again, people will probably slaughter me here and they'll probably say he's made some good films, but Rob Zombie's mm. entire career as a director is, uh, is something I would like to overlook. Yeah. And pretend it didn't happen, quite frankly. I agree. Um, yeah. Universal Pictures presents Halloween 2. More of the night he came home. Halloween 2 then so this is the one that sort of continues straight after Halloween 1 doesn't it it sort of yeah, finishes yeah, yeah. the night yes um, but suddenly it's a kind of 80s post Friday the 13th movie where like you say it suddenly gets a bit more of that kind of slashy gore element yeah. to it what, what are your thoughts on it's, Halloween it's one of those movies where it's quite fun and I love the soundtrack mm-hmm. um, I love there's the, the great intro the great um, Halloween theme with we carpeted it with Alan Howarth See, see, it's it's really a bit dark. more of a kind of upbeat disco yeah, it's, it's, like it's, real, it's like a really disco yeah. version of a Halloween theme. Um, and it, it's just it's a generic slasher movie. The hospital setting gives it a little bit of something. Uh, Loomis is interesting again. Uh, it, it, it introduces the, the wrinkle that Laurie is Michael's sister. Yes. Uh, and I said earlier on that I'm sure they just made that up. But I'm not sure. Maybe Carpenter yeah. and Deborah Hill may, meant it. Who knows? Mm. Um, but it strikes me that they were just making it up. Mm-hmm. Um uh, apart from that, it's one of those movies where if you want to, if you, <laughs> we're talking here about what Carpenter brings to movies, mm. and it's one of those films where you want to sit down and you go, okay, if you want to see what John Carpenter brings to a slasher movie, show someone Halloween and then show them Halloween Two, yes, right alongside it, and you know it's got much of the same beats, yeah, much of the same uh, ma- you know material and, and mm-hmm. setups. But there's a real difference between how someone like John Carpenter will approach something with classy and elegant, and someone like Rick Rosenthal, mm. who's not that great. Yeah, um, but it's fun. You know, it's okay. It's fine. And it's, it's the fun. classic kind of, I suppose, studio sequel, which is kind of the first one but more, isn't it? It's kind of the first one but turned up. Um, but again, it starts becoming about the kills. Yes, in a way already. Yes. Sorry, yes. From, you know, from Halloween too, it becomes about you know people being uh, stabbed with syringes and. Mm. Nah, you know, really being fucked up with knives. And, I remember the, yeah. the the nurse that gets stabbed, and there's that moment where she gets lifted up on the knife, yeah. and you see the shoes drop off, which is just hilarious. Yeah, well, that's, you know, yeah, that's that's a, that's a actually you know nice image. Halloween three, season of the witch, the night no one comes home. And then Halloween three, so Season of the Witch, that was the one Love where it. they went, oh, let's do something completely different. Let's Love get, you know, it. what a good idea. It's such a shame that they didn't kind of run with that. Actually, yeah, I think it's because it died in its arse. It died in its arse. It died yeah. in its arse. It could have been an amazing kind of oh, Halloween series became an anthology series almost, yeah. which could have been that's quite what cool. They, that's what they planned to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, uh, this is a movie I think that has uh, finally got its due. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I think this is a great movie. Yeah, yeah. And Carpenter is involved in it still. Yeah, uh, did again. Did the music with Alan Howarth. Really, really great soundtrack. Really doom laden and synthy yes. and and that um, awful Shamrock song. That oh jingle. Oh my god! <laughs> Three more days to Halloween, silver <laughs> Shamrock. Happy, happy Halloween. And it, it, it again is a film that absolutely shipped me up as a kid. Yes, because of the the masks and because of the snakes and the bugs oh. emerging from the masks. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and it's got one of the great endings. It's yeah. got it's got an amazing ending. I won't give away for people who haven't seen it. But yeah, it's, absolutely. It's dark. It's like it's it's scary and it's dark. It's great. Yeah, it's scary and it's dark. And it's got you know I've been lamenting the fact that Halloween movies and Friday the Thirteenth movies became about the kills, but mm. it has some kills that really. Again, stuck in my mind. There's yeah, a, a, there's a there's a drilling killing which is uh, pretty memorable. Yeah, um, I think someone gets their head ripped off by because they're robots. I mean, they just throw everything at this movie. <laughs> yeah, there are they do. there 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 are uh, killer Halloween masks. There are killer robots. There's all sorts of there are doppelgangers. There's yeah. all sorts of things in this film. And of course the creepiest jingle of all time. Yes, absolutely. The biggest earworm falls. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um but obviously like you say, that died on its ass, bombed. Um <laughs> so a few years later we get Halloween Ford, the return of Michael Myers, and then we kind of get this like what feels like a new little trilogy of films where you've yeah, got yeah, yeah. this new character of is it Jamie? Jamie Lloyd? Jamie Lloyd who yeah. was played by young Daniel Harris. <laughs> to kill that little girl and anybody who gets in his way. Oh, God. Who's going to be next? Ah! It's kind of a kind of 80s reboot of the original almost, isn't it? Yeah, and 
as I recall, four wasn't bad. No, it was the best because it got Donald Pleasance in yeah. it again, and you know Loomis is completely demented at this point. Yes, and, uh, uh, and it ends on a pretty decent cliffhanger, which mm-hmm. is really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, and five. I don't remember much I think about. that was the worst, I, as far as I remember. that was. The well, I think six is actually worse, isn't it? Because six yeah. is the one that has... Paul Rudd. Six got Paul Rudd, I can't yeah. remember. Wow. Yeah, he's the he's the sort of main guy in it. But that wow. just goes to show how memorable that movie is. Yeah, very I think I've, I've seen it once and I haven't, I haven't revisited it. It's, it's the one where they kind of start trying to explain that Michael Myers was kind of created by a cult of people yes. or something. Yeah, some sort yeah. of pagan death god. Or yeah, which yeah. Is, because they're they're trying to they're, they're, they're tying themselves in knots trying yes. to justify how he comes back because he starts at this point he's now dying and coming yes. back to life and yes. how do you explain that in a movie which is fairly realistic exactly yeah well, he's a pagan death god yeah now everyone will know the truth I knew what he was but I never knew why. since the origin of Michael Myers. That movie felt like it was going to run the franchise into the ground, but actually, a mere few years later, you've got this kind of post-Scream Halloween movie, Halloween H2O, which actually is quite good fun, I think, isn't it? Yeah, H2O is good stuff. It's got some decent uh, suspense sequences in it. Uh, It's got some, again, should be the the mentiness, but some decent kills, as I remember. But yeah. also, it's a it's a good story, and Jamie Lee Curtis is really really good in it. Yeah, so. yeah, and I think they basically ignore four, five, and six there, and you've just got they do ignore yeah. four, five, and six. Yeah, yeah. So this this series already has this kind of it's conf- it's very confusing. Isn't yeah, it? it retcons. It yeah. goes, oh, I didn't like that. So and Halloween three just doesn't exist yes. at any point. Never in the continuity of these movies. Yeah. And then you've got Halloween Resurrection, which all I remember is it's the one with Buster Rhymes. Yeah, same motherfucker a lot. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a it's a bit of a new low. It is. Uh, for the franchise. Uh, uh, I think it tried to do some sort of reality t- TV satire as well. <laughs> yeah. They're in a house and Michael Myers is stalking them and they've got TV and it's... Uh, it's yeah. And Laurie Strode gets killed in the first 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. One, one of those, you know, classic horror sequel it's okay I've killed the evil no the evil's back and it's in my house and it's killed me and that's killed me yeah exactly yeah uh, and then that was it really And the, unless you count of course Rob Zombie's Halloween and, which we don't uh, <laughs> which we won't talk any more no, about it's, yeah. uh, it's done so we haven't had a, a new Halloween film in at least sort of seven or eight years or even longer than that if you are ignoring the Rob Zombie ones um, but obviously there is now talk of a new film next year directed by David Gordon Green um, I mean what are your thoughts on the future of the Halloween franchise and actually the future of slashers in general I mean is there still a want for these types of movies do you think I think there is I think there is um yeah, people say that horror is cyclical in many, many ways. Mm-hmm. And we're going through this kind of resurgence of haunted house movies yes. and demon, demonic possession movies. And James Wan, who <laughs> people will yell at me for this, James Wan, who is a t- director, a horror director, as technically gifted as any of them, mm-hmm. I would say. And yeah. he is really interesting in different ways. Yes. Um, I th- I love the country films and I love the Insidious movies and I yeah. think you know the, he's he's really interesting and I think that um, if this current cycle begins to burn itself out if we're all tired of killer dolls if we want some blood and guts back if we want some blood and guts yeah. back then David Gordon Green who's not a person that I would have pegged necessarily no. as the savior of slasher movies but clearly is a man who loves his horror films because I know he wanted to re- uh, remake Suspiria yeah that's right. Um, so Danny, uh, isn't he doing with Danny McBride as well? Which one? The um, um, Halloween. Halloween story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, he's co-written it with with. So this is the Halloween. I was going to say remake, but it's not a remake because Jamie Lee Curtis is in it. And yeah, I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen here. I'm fascinated to know which ones they're ignoring because obviously Laurie Strode died in Halloween Resurrection. I she believe. did. Yeah. And are they gonna? Basically, continue it after Halloween two and forget everything. I wonder that came well, in between. That would be that would be sad in a way for me because Halloween H two O is a really efficient, really good, yep. 
uh, little slasher movie. But for me, it's you know, it's, it's Jamie Lee Curtis facing off against Michael Myers and yeah. saying goodbye to to this franchise definitively, mm-hmm. and not in a really kind of lame and embarrassing way that happened in Halloween Resurrection, which mm-hmm. that character oh, Laurie Strode was... didn't get to send off she deserved. Um, uh, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with this. Um, I have to say, when I saw the the image that she tweeted. Or she's dressed as Laurie Strode and Michael Myers is behind her and she's going, coming next year, Halloween. Um, I I lost my shit, yeah. I'll be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I think and, we all did. Uh, uh, you know, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. By the sounds of it, John Carpenter has kind of endorsed and his hinting that he might do the score for as yes. well. Yes. Yeah. Now that's interesting because yeah. Carpenter, of course, has executive producer credit on the remakes of most of his movies. Yes. Uh, so The Fog, which is Lamentable, Assault and Pissy 13, which I actually have a soft spot for. Mm-hmm. Ethan Hawke, Lawrence Fisher. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Uh, but this seems to be the... Uh, and then, of course, it was the Thing prequel. I'm not sure how much he was involved with that. Um, but this one, he seems to be like, no, I'm throwing my weight behind it. Yeah. I'm going to do the music. And we know he's mainly about the music these days. He is, isn't he? Did you yeah. go and watch his kind of what his on gig Halloween last year? Yeah, on yeah. Halloween night. What was it like? Was it good? Oh my god! It's uh, it was just amazing. It was amazing seeing John Carpenter on Halloween night um, <laughs> playing <laughs> Halloween <laughs> is one of the great experiences of my life. Even if it is essentially just an old man standing up on stage, and you know, because the music's quite simplistic. Yes. <laughs> he's basically just playing with one hand and you know well, it's like it's cool it was amazing this is what I couldn't decide whether or not to buy a ticket for this because I thought is it just is there more is there going to be more to it or is it just this old man on an electric keyboard playing his like three note tunes for all of his movies <laughs> which I do love but I didn't know whether it was worth buying a ticket to go and watch him oh do that live oh my god live. no he's, he's going on tour again because he's got this new album coming out which yeah, yeah, is yeah. re-recorded uh, a lot of his great movie themes and uh, if he does come over to England and he does play another gig or two gigs, or yes. whatever, get tickets, yeah. buy tickets. Okay. Because he, he plays with a well, he plays with a six piece band. His son is in the band. Oh, nice! And um, uh, and they're really really good, and they really beef up the sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he projects as well, or he did anyway. He made he may do something different, but he projects behind him clips from the movies as they come oh cool on. so it was just fantastic and then in between songs he would he would indulge in banter with the audience and it wasn't the greatest banter i've ever heard it was, <laughs> there was a possibility it may have been written down he was reading off uh, off an ipad or whatever but uh it was it was just wonderful to see and just the feeling of love in the room That's it, isn't it? And he still clearly has so many fans who love him, who love his work. His influence is living on. You see all these movies now, It Follows, and other types of movies that clearly draw so much inspiration from Carpenter. But the the last thing I want to ask you about is his kind of latter half of his career, I suppose. You know, he had this amazing run through the 70s and 80s from... Like you say, Assault and Precinct 13, Halloween, The Thing, Christine, The Fog, They Live, all these incredible movies. But what about post that? What about John Carpenter of the 90s and onwards? What are your thoughts? It's sad. It's Mm. it's sad. Um, I think he tailed off massively. You know, you could say that certain directors burn brightly for a while and then they maybe say all they need to say. Yeah. They run out of ideas or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But after that, you have films like Memoirs of an Invisible Man, which he was very much a hired hand. You have Village of the Damned, which isn't great. Yeah. Uh, In the Mouth of Madness, which again, I have to revisit. But um, I liked it. I didn't love it. I didn't mind his vampires film. Vampires, vampires, vampires was okay. Yeah. Vampires was okay. Ghost of Mars, not great. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> and it's sad because you get to a point and it's happening with Carpenter right now I think if John Carpenter tried to get a movie made tomorrow he'd really struggle mm. uh, I think if Joe Dante tried to get a movie made tomorrow he struggles so this is really John, crazy John Landis tries to get a movie made he, he'll struggle yeah. uh, and it's sad because you know you think they, they can't have lost it you know what I mean no. they can't have forgotten how to make films no they've got to be, there's still you know great directors in there yeah um, but they you know the, there does seem to be a point for all three of them and Carpenter I think in particular where the nineties happen and it, it just kind of stops for them. I just want great, great films from these guys. You yeah, know, one, you know, just to show that the fires are burning brightly. And I'm not talking about masters of horror episodes. No, I'm talking about proper 
Proper yeah, films. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so, so much. The, I was going to ask you now the things I kind of ask everyone at the end, but mm-hmm. you probably have already kind of answered this for uh, me. But what it. is your favourite horror movie and why? So I'm <laughs> guessing this is going to be an Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2. My answers are probably really uh, annoyingly pedestrian. I don't really have anything that's massively off the beaten path horror no, no. wise. Uh, but yeah, Evil Dead 2 uh, is a film I adore. I love The Thing. And uh, I also love. <laughs> The Omen. I love The Omen. Do uh, you? Yeah, yeah, I love The Omen. I don't. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm not a, a believer mm. in religious stuff. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, films about uh, the end of the world and the Antichrist and all that sort of for some reason really get under my skin. Yeah, me yeah. too. And cults and occults and all that kind yeah. of thing freaks me out a lot. Yeah. Well, this was going to be my next question. What is the scariest movie you've ever seen? What's the most scared you've ever been watching a movie? Holy crap! That's a good question. But one that really fucked me up recently is The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Oh, yeah. Um, the Scott Derrickson movie from, God, it was 2006? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah. Um, that movie scared me. Is it the and way she kind of scares me. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you know, it does. I mean, you know, it's, 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 a, it's as invasive as they come, The Exorcist. Yeah. But The Exorcism of Emily Rose is a, yeah, it's just a, it's a, decent it's a well-made horror film but it has this thread running through it where um tom wilkinson who plays a the priest at the center of the case um talks about how evil is most active at three in the morning mm-hmm. and so the the movie has these uh these incidents that keep happening at around three in the morning yeah. and he, he he sees a demon at three in the morning as far as i remember yeah and i just came over that movie and i found myself i couldn't sleep mm. i could not sleep and I was awake at three in the morning, watching the clock, just looking at the clock. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Shit scared. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I mentioned this to Scott Derrickson. I interviewed him recently. He said, "You're not the first person to tell me that, and you won't be the last." Wow. That, it's I, the thing I remember freaking me out from that movie is just the the way she kind of contorts her body. She's great, Jennifer Carpenter. She's and, great. And those yeah. shots of her where she's kind of weirdly twisted round yeah, in all yeah, those yeah. positions really yeah. freaked me out. She's yeah. one of those actresses, I think, who deserves. Uh, she's done very well well for herself, but yeah. she should have been a, a big star, I think. And yeah. uh, she's really great in that film. I'm also thinking now of uh, Session Nine. Oh. Which yes. Is, uh, Hello, Gordon. <laughs> that one. <laughs> Hello, Gordon. That's a film that 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 sh- that, that that really shipped me up as well. Yeah. And uh, if anyone does listen to the Empire podcast, and they'll be surprised I haven't I've taken so long to mention this film, but Event Horizon is <laughs> a, is a really surprising film that absolutely freaked me out. Um, and uh, I think that's becoming a praise now too, as a bit of it a modern is, classic. It is. I think that's you. We got you to thank for that, Chris. You championing uh, uh, single handedly. Twenty years old this year. <laughs> Event Horizon is. Could you do the? Um, did you do the Sam Neill impression from that film? Do you say? Do you say? Do you say? Perfect. That's the. I, I can't top that. That's the perfect moment to end it. on. I think. Um, thank you so so much for joining me, Chris. For people, where where can people find you in the world, Chris? Social media and that kind of thing. Right now, I'm in a cupboard. Yeah, exactly. I don't know where yeah. the hell I am. You're I'm locked in a cupboard. In the cupboard. BFI, and you assure me I can get out of here afterwards. Yeah. I if this, mean, if this probably. Is a, if this is the last thing I ever do. <laughs> yeah. If it's yeah. Michael Munster who killed is, me. This is where you'll find him. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no signal on my phone either. Look at no, this. No, we are no in signal. A, we are in a black zone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really sorry about that. Jesus. <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter as uh, at Chris Hewitt and uh, every week I'm hosting the Empire Podcast and we do spoiler specials and whatnot as well so uh, look out for updates for that and of course there's Empire Magazine every single month hurrah so there we go wonderful thank you so much uh, Chris and uh, happy Halloween happy Halloween a big thanks there to the brilliant Chris Hewitt now it's now time for us to get into our in-depth spoiler review of John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween. To join me to discuss this movie, I'm joined by a good friend and brilliant film critic and one of the nicest guys in the business, the brilliant Jacob Stolworthy. Jacob, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hello and welcome to my cosy little broom cupboard at the BFI. It's very cosy. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to 
Um, I don't want to insult you, Jacob, but you're like the fourth person I've had in this broom cupboard right, in the I'm last even. month. I'm gone. I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> not that you're not special to me in any way. But, uh, yeah, um, this is where I now frequent, apparently. <laughs> um, so just tell me a little bit about you. For people that don't know, what do you do? What are you, you know, what are you about? So I, uh, what am I about? As what a are deep, you about? It's a deep question. I know, right? I know. <laughs> um, I, uh, I write about film, TV and music for The Independent. Nice. Uh, plus other places, but primarily the independence uh, i've been there for a year and a half now um yeah so i, I get out i do I, I interview people i write features uh, i go to film festivals uh it's really I, cool it is it's fun and i hate to say it but jack of all trades like in, in in the sense that it, i think it's quite not rare but um it's quite refreshing to be able to do not just film even though film is my passion yeah, yeah. but but the tv and the music as well gets going with yeah. you gigs like for example you know that's that's quite nice um, you that probably, a lot of my friends don't get to do you are probably the envy of most people in the world that are into any kind of pop culture because yeah you do you do music festivals you do tv shows you do films you yeah, get to do all yeah. the fun stuff you get to like do like the glastonbury's boss <sighs> also going to do the 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 film program really cool. and do podcasts with lovely souls like yourself oh thank you very much and also radio you're on radio one i mean I you've been on tv one, you've done yeah. all sorts yeah, it's yeah. fun man it's all good i'm very lucky thank you for taking the time to do this you're my a very busy pleasure. man so thank you very Mate, much we all are my, it's my absolute pleasure um so it's very exciting actually this week because we are talking about John Carpenter's Halloween, finally. And it feels like this has been... We've been talking about slasher films, obviously, for the past few weeks, and it feels as though this is the film that everything leads to. It's mm-hmm. like this is the focal point. It, there's, there's, like, slasher movies before Halloween, and then there's slasher movies after Halloween. Yeah. And this is the one, it's really, the, the isn't biggie, it? The daddy. It is. It really is. Um, before we get into Halloween, just generally a horror genre. Are you a horror fan? What's your relationship like with horrors? I'm not a horror obsessive anymore. I was. Growing mm-hmm. up, I was the horror boy. Uh, I'd watch every horror uh, that had been, and that was coming <laughs> out. I'd be atop, on top of it. Um, now it's not that I don't love horror anymore it's yeah. just that I, I'm I don't know what it is really maybe it's it's, it's part of the being busy side of it but if yeah. there's like a new horror film out I add it to my list I want to see it yeah. but then I realise like a few years later when, when I'm talking about it uh, uh, talking about horror with someone they'll bring up the film that I wanted to see a few years ago and I haven't seen it yet <laughs> do you know what I mean I think it's just the volume it's the sheer volume of horror movies yeah. isn't it I think because it's a form uh, a genre that a lot of first-time filmmakers think is easy to make. And so most cheap independent movies out there that you see at festivals and stuff, you'll always get a bunch of horror movies, Mm -hmm. you know, because people think it's the easy, cheap thing to make. And usually it's not actually that easy to do well. But everyone tries their hat at a horror film, don't they? So, yeah, there are always hundreds to watch. Completely. And it's finding the good ones. It's why I I almost like to wait for recommendations. Totally. And, uh, And also, like, if I'm... Like I've got a few. I don't really like watching horror on my own. Not <laughs> may I add, because I'm scared. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also because I'm scared. But because uh, I just love it. I think it's such a fun um, shared viewing experience. Horror, yes. isn't it? It's just the ultimate. Uh, and I've got uh, one friend. I'm going to give him a shout. His name. His name is uh, Demi, mm-hmm. um, and he is my horror pal. And we just kind of watch the really kind of fucked up horrors yeah you know that that you well, feel like a bit centipede exactly but, the, yeah, the martyrs yeah. which i hadn't seen <sighs> uh like i watched about four years ago and i was i was waiting because i needed to watch it with demi you know and we uh the films you don't really want to sit in on your own on a saturday night and watch yeah um but yeah, so I do, I stash them up yeah. and then I kind of splurge on them. I don't know how I'd feel about watching Martyrs with somebody else. I watched it on my own and I felt like I, I don't know, I felt depressed and dirty by the end of it. Mm-hmm. And how did, I mean, watching that with a mate, I don't know if that would be better or worse. We were a, a bit like, we had a few glances of, how are we feeling about this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or where the hell is this going? And, yeah. and isn't this amazing? Because yeah. obviously it's a very, it's a, it's a brilliant film, but um. There, there are, yeah, I guess that one doesn't lend itself to the shaving experience as well as some things, say, like, um, trying to think of a good example. I mean, slashes are a good example. Slashes are they? a good example. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Slashes are a very good example. And, and actually, most people that have been on this podcast always say as well, oh, paranormal activity and those types of movies, great to watch with an audience, yes. great to watch with mates. You all kind of jump together, then laugh together, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 completely. Yeah. Um, nice. So... Halloween then I mean mm. so le- 
let before we get into Halloween, the story itself, when we get into the film properly, I mean, what are your general memories and thoughts and views of Halloween? So I probably first watched Halloween when I was. I'm, I'm trying. To, I've been trying to think about this today, actually. Mm. Quite young. Um, I probably 12, 13. Mm-hmm. Just crazy because that's, that's my little brother's age now, and he would not want to watch Halloween. Yeah. Um, but I remember watching it. I remember I bought it. In, I bought it in Blockbuster. And it they was did, like they did cheap. sell. They did yeah. sell, the, yeah. And and it was very cheap. And I remember I watched it, and I knew that was my favourite horror film. Yes. And I just had a feeling I knew that. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that we get to talk about this film today because it really <laughs> is my favourite horror film. I remember the minute I watched it, I knew I was going to watch that every Halloween, no matter what. Mm-hmm. And I I love because I love you know love watching Halloween films on Halloween like yes, Christmas films or Christmas like we do that. But like I hate when they put Halloween on TV on like June the nineteenth. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, why? Why, why right. are you doing this? It's not right. So I knew, that and that, I, I, and the score just stayed with me oh. the minute, and the minute you saw the, the titles, pumpkin, just so simple, and it's the soundtrack of Halloween, that's for sure. Oh, it, it really if you want to give people the the creeps when they're walking past, like kids walking past, blast that song, blast yes. the music out, right? Yes. So yeah, Halloween really instantly grabs me, and it's stayed with me yeah. ever since. I think you know we've been for the past three weeks talking about these other movies that are kind of. You could argue a slashers, but it's more that they're kind of forerunners to the slasher. So you've mm. got Psycho, which obviously it does feature, you know, a guy with a knife killing women. And you've got Peeping Tom and uh, the sort of Italian Jallo movies where, again, you've got this masked, gloved killer stalking women. But also it has all these other elements to it. And then yeah. you've got Black Christmas, which does have a lot of these elements, but wasn't really a big success commercially. And now you've got this movie and it feels like this is the moment when they perfect the formula now. It's like stripped down to a perfect, pitch-perfect note here. Yeah. Um, But let's talk about it, Len. So let's go into John Carpenter's Halloween. Halloween night. A small American town. Fifteen years ago. So uh, this is what I love about Halloween as well. It's straight in there. It's so it's simple. So simple. Yeah, yeah. It's so simple. So it's uh, it's Halloween Eve. Yes. Uh, and uh, we a doctor, a psychiatrist, is going to transport a mental patient mm-hmm. uh, who we're told is very evil, called Michael Myers, uh, to uh, another asylum altogether. Uh, he escapes and he uh, goes back to the scene of the crime where he murdered his sister. Yes. Uh, and he goes back to Haddonfield, the fictional town of Haddonfield, yes. Illinois, and he uh, wreaks uh, havoc upon uh, unsuspecting babysitters. Yes, <laughs> this is it. Like, it yeah. sounds, when you say it now, like a plot that is so generic and yeah. kind of unoriginal but of course this was the original but it is literally okay there's a man with a knife he escapes from a mental institution and he goes after teenage girls he and that's, sti- that's steal, it steals a mask puts yeah. it on and hunts them down yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and and the reason it sounds cliche and unoriginal is because of this movie that did it first right. and spawned so many uh, you know imitators didn't mm. it um, yeah I mean I don't know where to start with this movie really to be honest I mean first of all so you've you said it you've already said it, it's your favourite horror movie yeah you are a huge fan of this film yes yeah i mean i I, going back to what you said before yeah i think that this is the film that it may not have established the rules Mm -hmm. per se but it certainly underlined them yes it it, it, it bolded them up and it's because of this film that we got so much more of what came afterwards within this within the slasher genre it kind of firmed those tropes Mm -hmm. and you know, tropes almost now d- comes with a, a negative connotation. Almost, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, it's you know, it's done, run or whatever. But yeah. Halloween, it's it always strikes me when I rewatch it, and I rewatched it last night again for the who who ever knows how many. How many times. <laughs> um, it it just always shocks me how fresh it feels. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that is so much down to John Carpenter and his direction more than yeah. anything. More than the writing, even. I think it's the it's the direction, definitely. Um, but also, like, the other thing that always takes me by surprise with Halloween, that, you know, again, you think of it as this quintessential slasher movie and you would, you would maybe lump it in the same world as, you know, Friday the 13th mm-hmm. and 
slumber party massacre and all those 80s ones but actually it's quite different in a lot of ways it doesn't have a huge body count it doesn't have a huge amount of blood it takes a long time for the killing to actually start mm-hmm. apart from the opening scene it's a real slow burn as well it's isn't such it? a slow burn and this is what i love about it away from being a, hor- a great horror film it's just a great film yeah and it's so it's everything is just so um Manage- manageable like you, you're yeah. never it's not sprawling in any way and I love that like 10 minutes in you're straight you know what's going on he's yes. go, he's going back to Haddonfield yes. uh, and Donald Pleasance's uh, character yes. Loomis is he's going back because he's evil and he needs to <laughs> recapture <laughs> yeah. the evil you know the stakes are there that's exactly what this film is and you know you, you then know you then meet Jamie Lee Curtis's character yes. and her two friends and you know that that night they're going to be babysitting within the same perimeter yeah. you know, they're very near each other so you know exactly where we're going to be based and where the danger is going to happen and I just love that it, it takes you know where you're working towards it takes its time to get there and because and it doesn't even it's not even like it's even trying to ratchet up the tension no. it just happens na- it's like it happens naturally because John Carpenter is very happy to just kind of sit back and let the film unfurl and it's only 90 minutes he knows John Carpenter knows how to make a small budget 90 minute you know what could for a lot of directors be a throwaway movie or idea mm-hmm. becomes something monumental I mean same with The Thing as well that yeah. came after this you know like simple ideas but with with really well executed with really good characters as well which is so important um kim newman said as well in episode one you know the thing that makes halloween such a brilliant movie more than anything is that it's not about michael myers it's about laurie strode she's an instantly likable character and i think it's something that is really lacking in 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 films today and it's it's the one thing where films really do struggle to emulate halloween yeah is that is that laurie is such a likable character um, she's. I mean, not, not that her friends aren't, but her friends are more bullshit. Yeah. They kind of. They kind of. <laughs> her rib friends her. are awful. They are kind they are of awful people. They are kind of awful. <laughs> uh, but you know, you kind of. Yeah, and Laurie, you're, you're, you question why Laurie's friends with them for sure. This is where I'm going to get later to the the few issues I have with this movie, but it mainly comes down to those other girls. Really? But, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's start at the beginning. I think let's let's. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of in my head work through this chronologically. I mean, the opening scene. Again, like a brilliant opening scene that is quite shocking when you first watch it as yeah. well. You know, you've got this point of view shot of this. We don't know who it is at this point stalking this house at night. I love the, um, I love the, I mean, the film is absolutely filled to the brim with amazing, astounding musical cues. But I love the scene where um, the light comes on and it, make, it makes, yeah. the, the, you know, the, the like, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wasn't going to go there. You did and you nailed it better than I could, man. <laughs> Uh, and it's because it, it makes you jump, and it, it's yeah. got, and you're like, okay, well, you know, little things like that. You know, in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about Peeping Tom. Peeping Tom has a very, very similar opening scene, mm. um, and so does Black Christmas. And you can see John Carpenter taking from these other movies, but again. He executes it better, probably, than most other directors. That's the thing. And even though it's not wholly original, he still does it so well. That's the thing. And and those moments when he's peering through the window and whoever this person is, we don't know at this point, comes in and you see him kind of retrieve that kitchen knife and walk upstairs. It's pretty creepy. It's so creepy. And it it, it somehow manages to turn it on its head, Carpenter. Mm. You assume it's going to be, you know... A, a, an older male I guess you kind yeah. of make you make that assumption yeah um, and for no reason other than that, just, just pure expectation yeah um, and of course when you see it's it's obviously her little, little brother and yeah. it's a little boy and it, it, it's shocking it is shocking and even the scene where he kills his sister and it's and this is what I love about Halloween and that it, it, it's not violent it's not gory mm-hmm. and the way that she the way, the way that I assume Carpenter directed the scene it, it seems like it should be quite laughable but because it, it's so almost like dreamlike and ethereal mm-hmm. this scene it's quite it's, it makes it all the more disturbing yeah and it really adds to what I love about Halloween Michael <laughs> It is ethereal and it's 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 different. It you know you could argue some of these actors are bad actors, mm. but you're right. There's kind of this other quality to it Completely. that makes it that that kind of transcends that a little bit. And again, it's what other directors lost when they try to emulate it later on, where you do just get bad actors. Yeah, you know. You know? But yeah, you're you're totally right. That that whole mood, you know, bring you know, brings that up. You it know, doesn't it doesn't seem real, does it? And yeah. but I've got to say the opening scene. It ends with one of 
the, the, the things that frustrate me most about the film. Yeah, cool. When Michael Myers is stood outside and he's holding the uh, knife mm-hmm. and he takes the mask off and then it cuts away from mm-hmm. the POV shot and you see his parents mm-hmm. looking at him. His mum... Puts her, hands Puts her hands in her pocket. She's just like, oh, like chilling outside. <laughs> Let's not run in and see if he did anything with that knife. Maybe killed my daughter. Let's just sit there and put my hands in my pocket. Oh my it God. Stru- that is, yeah, it struck me that on rewatch as well. It's some, n- never anything I remembered. You all remember that shot, but actually, again, it's kind of dreamlike and weird and stylized so you can forgive it. Yeah. But yeah, you, you think, okay, if you, we're talking in realistic terms here, why would the parents just stand there for what feels like about 20 seconds <laughs> and not do anything? It's like they wait for the lights to go down on the stage or something. <laughs> yeah. Just standing there like... It's, it's like the Austin Powers laugh while the fade-out happens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. It is, it's, it's a long moment while they all just look at each other. Yeah, It's, it's very odd. It's amazing. But again, you can kind of forgive you it. You do forgive Because it. when you first watch it, I think you're so shocked by, oh my God, it's a little child and he's dressed as a clown and he's holding a knife. This is really creepy yeah that you don't really notice it it was only upon rewatch last night that i even noticed Notice. that <laughs> i watched it with rihanna who was on the podcast last week and actually we both went what is that mum doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> i had the same thought and i think i've thought it before but i last night it just it really bugs me yeah 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 it's like john carpenter's going just hold it hold it a bit longer hold it a bit longer don't move keep looking and i just think that even after like kind of when john carpenter watched the premiere he was like oh no like yeah the, 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 she's putting her hands in her pockets and she looks really like not worried at all Oh, even though he's where he's holding a knife that's bigger than him. I know, I know. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. But but overall, a brilliant opening scene. Absolutely, and class. it kind of it jumps you straight in there. It's like very very simple. And then also the other thing is again that I forget is that we jump straight to this. I'm controversially going to say this is I think the scariest moment in the whole film yeah. coming up. When so then we jump 15 years later and we see Sam Luke. Sam Loomis? Sam no. Loomis, that's his name. Yeah. Is that his name? I think it is. Weirdly, yeah. that is also the name of Janet Lee's boyfriend's character's name in Psycho. I mean, it's not like a, weirdly. It's maybe, obviously, uh, maybe it's a different first name, but it's certainly Loomis. I mean, it's Dr. Um, Loomis anyway, isn't it? And, yeah. and obviously the name Loomis, because then later on down the line, we're going to talk about Scream and Sydney's boyfriend is called Billy Loomis. Billy Loomis. Um, there's all the kinds of crossovers. Loomis runs through. Very important. But anyway, we see Dr. Loomis and this nurse and they're, you know, by this point, Michael Myers is must be, what, 20 or 21 and he's they're about to transport him i think aren't they mm. they're about to kind of take him somewhere else and uh they 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 turn up it's this dark stormy night in this car and donald pleasance does his thing all he does throughout the whole film is basically say things like oh well it's pure evil he's not a real man and all, you know it's so effective it's, but it's so oh, i'm pissed it's brilliant it's i love so it so brilliant he, he refers to him as it at one point and the nurse is like aren't you being a bit extreme yeah. you should maybe Just call, call him, him he <laughs> and he's like well you've obviously never met him blah 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 <laughs> Are there any special instructions? Just try to understand what we're dealing with here. Don't underestimate it. Don't you think we could refer to it as him? If you say so. But they rock up at this asylum and suddenly you see all these people just wandering in these white gowns and that John Carpenter music kicks in at that point again. That, for me, is still, I think, one of the creepiest images. And then what happens directly after this when somebody runs on the roof of the car. Yeah. It's just really Springs scary. On, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh. Like superhuman. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely love... And it's weird because... And for a kind of format wise I suppose for a horror film what you usually get is the opening kill followed by then it's all calm for a long time Mm -hmm. this has like one scary moment followed by another just really scary moment which is interesting it's just insanely well structured yeah yeah, um, and like I think that's that's the thing with a lot of horror films, you're kind of waiting, you're biding your time yes. until you get to the good stuff. But yes. with Halloween, it's just there yeah, exactly. instantaneously. Exactly, because then you get this moment where Michael Myers, now adult Michael Myers, runs up on the roof of that car and he smashes his hand comes just, down, really terrifies yeah. me, uh, smashes the window, steals the car, and goes. And by this point, we're probably running time wise about six minutes into the movie, and we already know everything we need to know. Mm. He was an evil little boy stabbed someone to death, went to an institution for 15 years, and now he's broken out again. And mm. like all of that happens in the first five minutes, basically, doesn't mm. it? And that's that's it. And then the movie begins proper. Kind of yeah, thing. when it's we so get to cool. Haddonfield. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love also that he's, like, Don Pleasance, like you say, is really building up Michael as mm. an evil, malevolent force. Um but yeah, he doesn't kill the nurse. He doesn't kill him. He just gets the car no. and he goes. And I like that about Mike. He's very like in, in this is this is like a personal thing, really. I just 
his unpredictability yeah and the way that he doesn't strike I mean, he kind of bides his time and you, you know one could argue that it's for the sake of building up to a very thrilling terrifying climax but i i really don't agree with that myself i like the idea that he's just really unpredictable you mm-hmm. never know when he's going to strike yeah he, he kind of decides when he kills people when he doesn't um and it just adds to his 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 evilness yeah it's really. true he's he's like really calculating isn't yeah. he like i think there's lines later on where donald pleasant says you know like i watched him he sat and stared at a wall for 15 years kind of planning this exact date and this mm. what he was going to do and yeah you're right you know the, the for the first like 70 percent of the movie all he does is wander about and he do- there are moments when he runs into people children at the school I and stuff he doesn't kill anyone ever mm. and it's like he's choosing who he wants to kill and why and we don't know why and like obviously in the sequels it kind of reveals a bit more why but at this point you're just thinking why you know it's just random yeah almost. he's yeah. almost like he's almost like he's just, he's just screwing with people like yeah. the bit where uh annie's um she she, she just undresses herself because she's got the, the food all over her yes. but he, he drops to he drops the plant that's right. Yeah, it's like yes, he's yes, like yes, he's yes, really yes. screwing with her here. Yeah, you know? and I, 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 that's kind of what makes him such a scary um, character for me. But I'm sure we'll get to that. No, later. true, yeah. it's true, and it's like it's that thing of again that all these sequels and all these uh, you know imitators pick up on, which is yeah, he doesn't kill most of the adults he doesn't kill the children he kills the teenagers mm. he kills the teenage girls that's all he's interested in is basically these three teenage girls he sees walking home from school mm. essentially they're the only people really that he targets and the people that happen to be with them yeah throughout that night but it's like they're the only three he wants completely and it, it's, it's almost like as well like the because he doesn't kill the kids you're right but there's a moment where um where is it is it tommy yeah kid, tommy, tommy where he after the kid um the, Kids are all teasing Tommy. Yes, he falls and he breaks his pumpkin, and the kids will run away. And he, the kid, runs into Michael Myers. Yes, in one of what I find the, the eeriest moments. Yes, so Michael Myers. The camera follows him along as he watches Tommy. Yeah, that's you're bit, it. And you're just a bit like, why? Are you, mm. Why have you picked these people out? Why have you picked out Laurie and Tommy? Yeah, just because he, you know, they kind of were at his house that he, yeah. he happened to be inside earlier why though and i love that because like you say you don't know in this you don't know in this film. no it, it's never answered and no i love that it's, it's brilliant so, so much is completely left unanswered in this which is what makes it work so well yeah. definitely it doesn't and this is the thing we talked about with previous um the kind of proto slashes that come before it psycho has this huge exposition about why norman bates does what he does you know at the end and uh, all these kind of giallo movies from the from italy yeah very convoluted oh this person is had all these childhood traumas and that's why he targets people that do this and that's why he dresses like this and it it goes out of its way to explain and over explain everything mm. and again these things get stripped away for halloween where you realize actually it's like john carpenter knew what worked and what didn't about all these movies that came before it and it knew exactly how to pull this off yeah yeah it's so that. so good sometimes the less you understand and the less you you know the better it is i think the scarier it is yeah the reason the shining i think is so scary and so many people find it scary is because you don't know what the fuck is going on mm. for most of it why is there a guy dressed as a bear giving a blowjob to a guy and you know like why are there why is there blood coming out of elevated doors you don't know what the hell is happening for yeah. most of the time it's like david lynch as well it's like these things are scary because they're like it's like nightmare logic nightmare. Yeah, yeah yeah and that's Horrible. what halloween I, th- I think it's so nightmarish yeah Totally. Like, like, and like through through starting kind of like in like a like the ethereal way we spoke about mm. it being like dreamlike and then coalescing into just a, a horrific nightmare. Yeah. Don't forget to drop the key off at the Myers place. I won't. They're coming by to look at the house at ten thirty. Be sure to leave it under the mat. Promise. And then, so obviously, after that kind of opening scary stuff, then we go to these scenes that are like. You know, in theory, quite calm, but they still have this eeriness to them. But these brilliant scenes where you see these like suburban streets and these leaves coming down, and that music as Jamie Lee Curtis kind of walks down the street and everything. Yeah. It's so identifiable as well. Yes. Like this is uh, this is something that I do recall thinking when I was younger watching Halloween. Yes. Is that this could happen on my street? Yeah. And I think that's that kind of as as a kid who wants to be scared. Yes. That was really what what Halloween managed to really tug on, tug at, and and I think. It's so identifiable, and Hannafield is a fictional place. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but it, it could be, it could just look outside your window that could be going on. Totally. It's just rows of, and there's a line, isn't there, where the policeman says, you know, oh, it's just rows of houses of two, you know, and uh, that's true. It's like any little town, basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so true. And again, like looking at movies that came before this, you had Norman Bates who lived in the middle of nowhere mm. and he only murdered people that came to him, you know, right. and stayed at his motel or, or, you know, same with a lot of these other movies. Whereas, yeah, you're with Halloween, you are not safe in your own home, basically on your own street that yeah. looks so pretty and safe from the outside. Yeah. And like almost like there's got to be so many people around in these houses. Yeah. But why is no one helping me? Yeah, God, yeah. which is a scary moment that we'll get to later. Yeah. But yeah, uh, um, amazing. Yeah. Um, so then we meet our kind of main characters. So you've got you've got Jamie Lee Curtis, who <laughs> plays Laurie Strode, who is just brilliant, She's actually. Great. And every time I watch it, I just think, God, she is good, isn't she? Yeah. Like, this was, I think, her very first acting gig. It was, it? yeah. She didn't get paid a lot for it. And I think he knew that he was onto a winner, be it her being Janet Lee's daughter. <laughs> yeah. so, and I think he was he was vocal about that, right? Yeah. And it is probably, you know, like, he scratched my cynical. back, I scratched yours. Yeah. yeah, exactly. How can you walk into school this way? My dad asked me to. Why? I have to drop off a key. Why? Because he's going to sell a house. Why? Because that's his job. Where? The Myers house. The Myers house? Laurie and Tommy go to the Myers house Ooh, yeah. and and it and as she goes up to the door it cuts that's the POV shot from behind the door and you're like oh god like someone looking at he's looking out he's looking at her but what I love is it breaks the POV when Michael comes in to shot yes. and it's got the, the music and it's it for me that's probably the um, the jumpiest moment absolutely it made me jump it made me jump watching it again definitely because yeah. I always forget that you always know it's going to cut to the POV and you're going to hear his breathing yeah. but then you're right when it kind of breaks that POV and suddenly he's in frame it's and alarming. that loud burr, yeah. you know music really well so done so alarming it's yeah. really well done and that house is creepy you know you, creepy just, you, you feel the kind of creepy. dark memories from that house which yeah. is great yeah yeah in fact I, I was in um, I went to of all places yeah. I went to Montauk recently in wow. New York which is very random yeah um I walked past that house. Like, it wasn't that house, but it was a house that was so much like that. And I got a photo of it. And uh, if there's any way we can show any listeners to see it, because it was the most, it was the scariest ass house if you, did you take a seen. photo of it got a photo oh, of it oh well we just tweet it yeah Excellent. okay amazing. We'll get it out. amazing well yeah because actually the, the the house itself the whole film was shot in California right Um, and the house itself is now this you know this like museum almost I mean it is a house that a family live in but they have so a pump- bizarre they have a pumpkin outside all year round and people come and take photos in front of it amazing. and stuff it is the Myers house Lonnie Eels that's a haunted house he said awful stuff happened there once Lonnie Lamb probably won't get out of the sixth grade um, but she does so much of that role. Yes. So much of that role that, that even if a film was written of that caliber today, I doubt they do as well as Jamie Lee Curtis manages. Yeah, you know? yeah you're so right. And she she's so natural and real, I think. Everything she does, you kind of believe, you get. And actually, you, you know, not that much of her character is really revealed. There are these odd lines about a boy that she may or may not fancy. And there's, you know, but it feels like with the very little information you get, you know everything you need to know about her, don't you? Yeah. The way that she is with the children when she babysits and the way she she's this kind of good girl like absolute good girl she's just yeah she's good natured she's very sweet and she what i like is that you know she she does express interest in this boy yeah she's not she's not virginal she just isn't uh willing to be upfront in the same way that her friends are yeah and and what and good for her um i think she's very sweet and there's so many and there's so many lines and um, line deliveries Mm. that she uh jamie lee curtis absolutely nails and one that i love especially is a scene where she sees the the iconic moment where she sees Michael Myers mm-hmm. kind of goading her, where he stood um, half obscured by the bush. And yes, she, and she can see, and then she she says, "There's a guy stood there," and then her friend runs down yeah. and starts like taunting her, and then Jamie Lee Curtis runs around instead of getting angry with her friend, she just says quite in a quite morose manner. She says, "He was stood right there." Yeah. I, like in, in a way that I know I'm right. I know yeah. he's there, and I love that about her. Other other characters, you know, maybe in films these days or films immediately afterwards, would have been like, "Oh, I could have sworn I saw someone there," or, yeah. or starts questioning their sanity. But she knows what she sees. She's very yeah. switched on. You're standing right there, poor Laurie, you scared another one away. Yeah, you're right. She says these lines throughout the movie that are kind of throwaway that she says under her breath as mm. well that are just so perfect. Like yeah. it's exactly what 
a normal person, a normal human being would say, exactly. you know, which is perfect. Which is more than I think you could say for her two friends. And I think this is where, <laughs> this is the one issue I have with this movie. And again, it it, it, it's, it becomes a trope with all slashers, but you've got these teenage girls that are so cardboard cut out they are <laughs> unbelievable so her two best friends annie i think is one of them yeah, and Lindsay, annie and linda yeah. linda, linda that's yeah. it annie and linda um and which one is it that cannot stop saying the word totally as well totally <laughs> i think i think that's linda you know it's totally insane we have three new cheers to learn in the morning the game is in the afternoon i have to get my hair done at five and the dance is at eight i'll be totally wiped out i don't think i have enough to do tomorrow totally so funny and you know we were talking last week we were talking about Black Christmas Black Christmas is still controversially in my opinion in some ways a better film and I think personally it's because of the characters I feel the fear more because I believe all of the characters Mm -hmm. they all talk like human beings to one another they all have their own issues and their own stuff going on whereas these two they come out and, and, and Linda is like oh my God, it's totally, I've got to get my hair done and then I've got to go to the prom and then I've got to do this. And it is like, it's the most, and again, it's hard to, I suppose it's hard to put this down because it was the first one to do it in a way, but it it feels like the most cliche teenage girl you could possibly create. Yeah. You know, it somehow gets away with it though, isn't it? Like, <laughs> like it's almost like you don't realise how annoying she is until afterwards and you're thinking back about the film. That's like, that, you know, upon retrospect, she is very annoying. <laughs> she's such, yeah, she's, she's... I just want her to die. And that's <laughs> maybe it. Maybe, again, it's the, it's the way that the slasher movie evolves where you just want to watch these people get picked off yes, and that's all you want. Let's see some and murder. again, he does it very well because he's given us the final girl who we like and actually want to survive, but every other character, we do not care if yeah. they get killed off in horrible ways. So you're never really, you're never emotionally attached to the point where you're upset by it because, <laughs> I mean, me personally, I just couldn't wait for these two girls to die. Yeah. <laughs> so who cares? I always forget my chemistry book and my math book and my English book and my, let's see, my French book and, well, who needs books Anyway, I don't need books. I always forget all of my books. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Even Annie. I kind of took to Annie. Annie, the one who was babysitting across the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was better. The one who gets stuck in the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She was a bit better, actually. She's all right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even but she's so horrible to Jamie Lee. She's so horrible to Laurie Stretch. She's like, oh, you scared another one off. He's when, very rude. <laughs> she's so, very rude. She's so horrible. She's, basically, they both just like mock her for being a virgin constantly. Yeah. It feels like. That is well. actually a real low blow, that line, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. Especially when she's quite spooked. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, that's the thing. I just think her friends are fucking horrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the fact that one of them wants to come around and use the house that one of them is babysitting in just to have sex and stuff. You just say, oh my God. I think that's so funny. But, you know, we were all teenagers once. We were all teenagers this once, exactly. This is what happens. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, again, you know, all unintentional, I'm sure, but it's setting up all of these tropes that are going to be forever replicated. Completely. Hey, isn't that Devon Graham? I don't think so. Also, what we should talk about, I suppose, is the presence of Michael Myers. And le- even in some of these silly scenes where you've got teenage girls talking about silly stuff, it still works because you are still spotting in the background of every frame Michael Myers lurking yeah. over them, which is just amazing, isn't it? And it feels like every time I watch it, I spot him more. And and also, each time I watch him, I, I still forget where he's going to be. Yes. And it's like when uh, when Tommy's looking out the window <sighs> and he's staring him down. And th- those are some of the scariest moments. Because yes. when you're younger and you look out the window and you think someone's going to be looking out at you. Yes. It reminds you of a time when I was younger. Yeah. One, once there was someone looking up down and it just kind of oh, always God. brings you back to that moment yeah. I don't know who that guy the guy was and it was almost a moment of looked away like what the hell looked at again he was gone it was very oh. Halloween maybe he just loved Halloween he wanted to be that Michael Myers <laughs> figure in my life but uh, yeah. it's I always forget where Michael Myers is going to be in the frame yeah. and I'm always like, looking you're just looking for the, the kind of like little blob of white yeah. for his mask aren't you Yeah. what's the name of the of the girl that Annie's babysitting I can't oh, think. that's Lindsay. Is that Lindsay? That's Lindsay. That's Lindsay. I knew there was a character called Lindsay. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. Lindsay, and um, and she's the TV's so loud, and she can't yeah. hear and shout. And then then she goes to put her clothes, and he goes to put her clothes in the, in the tumble dryer. Yeah, and it's just it's so you're just waiting for it. And Michael Myers is around, but you just don't yeah. know where he is, and you don't know when he's going to pounce. It's really terrifying. Those scenes are excellent. I've got to say, like he's just p- p- perfects the kind of tension suspense that lead up to those death scenes definitely completely yeah, absolutely amazing um, yeah I, I mean what do you think of the mask in general then we should talk about the mask <laughs> I mean like do you know the background of the mask and what it was based on it's so yes yeah, sh- I mean it's it was a Captain Kirk mask yeah right? William Shatner and what did they do to it 
he basically removed the eyes and I think painted it or sprayed it white and that's what <laughs> happened, you know, and that's it and that's all he did. You know, the film was such a low budget. I think it was made for something like $20,000 uh, $20, or something. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, so that's all they that's all they did. They bought this from a kind of Halloween shop. I love just changed I it up a bit. I absolutely love the mask. It's so simple and it's yeah. so effective. A lot like this film. The, the mask is ever yeah, together. It's it just, is. just very effective. It's very like why well let's not kind of overcomplicate anything. Yeah. This is is scary. Like why add anything why why embellish this? This yeah. is scary as it is the whole point of him i suppose is that he doesn't he could be anyone he's because uh, originally he you know in the script apparently he was just called the shape he wasn't called michael right. myers yeah. or whatever he was just the shape and that's kind of all he is in this film isn't he really yeah. obviously the sequels flesh him out a bit but yeah you, you he is just this looming presence the whole way through it's amazing yeah i was reading the guy he, he, he was like what's the guy who played him was like what shall i what do i um what's my motivation yeah and then John Carpenter was like, you just need to get from there to there. <laughs> and, and it's so simple because you see him walking and it, it, he is, that's what he's doing. That's he's getting there. It just so happens that at the end of where he's trying to get to is a very terrified lady running away from him, yeah. you know, and that's that's all, all the scene needs. It's incredible, isn't it? Because I wonder what they thought when making this. I wonder if they thought this is absolute bullshit, you know, like without the music, without John Carpenter's editing and everything else, when they were originally shooting just this guy in this William Shatner mask just walking <laughs> menacingly from one end of a street to the other and that's all he was doing or yeah. standing, you know, standing on the other side of a road looking towards the camera you know i wonder if they knew how terrifying this would end up looking right it's amazing yeah 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 john carpenter must be like well good job my music's looped over this because <laughs> it's gonna scare the bejesus out of you all yeah, the music yeah. i mean we have touched upon the music already but it really is something it's isn't it character in the film and i know it's so cliche to say but it really is and it's the soundtrack of halloween and it's just every time it comes in yeah. you do feel a sense of dread yeah and it's it's part of this kind of less is more thing i suppose mm-hmm. isn't it the, and also you feel like this music is again you know keep talking about how much it influences and not just the film and the story but the music has influenced so many other you look at every recently as well you know with movies like it follows it and follows the is a, and, it's a real and yet yeah, exactly even stranger things you you see all these movies now replicating this 80s john carpenter synthy piano y kind of very simple themes don't yeah. you it's just so, it just works so well. Yeah. Simple but effective. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, totally. <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> can't believe I did that. Um, yes. Um, so, oh, Linda. Oh, Linda. We, we should we should start talking about some of these murder scenes then because yes. th- this happens. So all of this is like build up, isn't it? And I think I looked at the running time and I think it's not until about 45, 50 minutes into the film before the murders Things actually start, start happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as the story progresses, you've got these girls getting ready for their night on Halloween and also it's we're jump cutting between that and Donald Pleasant's character Sam Lewis who's still sort of vaguely trying to find Michael isn't he and he kind of knows where he's going but doesn't really seem to know what's going on he's just milling time. about I find yeah. it so funny that yeah. he's just literally he's standing in bushes scaring kids away from Michael Myers' <laughs> house and really having a good time doing it I know <laughs> there's that brilliant moment where he smiles he loves it I met this six year old child with this blank pale emotionless face and the blackest eyes the devil's eyes but he has that really famous speech now where he sort of says there's nothing behind the eyes mm-hmm. the devil's eyes and all that kind of stuff and again it's like <laughs> like Kim Newman said it's like absolute nonsense in psychological terms given this guy's supposed to be a doctor, a doctor. but it's, it's like- all part of this brilliant build up of suspense isn't I, it? I always feel like Sam, uh, Sam Loomis if his name is Sam I mean, yeah a Dr. Loomis would be um, he'd be great in PR <laughs> I always feel this. he'd be so good at writing a press release. He'd be really good at doing a poster quote, <laughs> wouldn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah he'd yeah. be great for a little pool quote. Mate. He would. But I, I always feel like, but I love that scene. Like, like Donald Pleasance in this film, such a such a performance, and kind of better than the role has any right to be. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realised that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. 
he he was I think pretty much the only name wasn't he at the time yeah. in the movie and the movie was so low budget and I, I think originally they asked a couple of other actors classical actors like him like Peter Cushing and I think maybe Christopher Lee as well and they both turned it down I think yeah it was I, so little money and Christopher Lee described it as one of the worst mistakes <laughs> in his career which yeah. I can see you can see why right yeah, yeah absolutely yeah because it was the one iconic mo- horror movie that Christopher Lee wasn't it was in. yeah exactly <laughs> but, he's getting greedy yeah, yeah exactly damn it I should have done that one as well <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, Donald Pleasance did it and I think they could afford to have him for something like two days of filming. So they did all of his scenes in one go. Yeah. He just turned up and said all these ominous lines and then left. Just basically. did a bit of walking, said these lines. Yeah. And, yeah. But what's so amazing is that he ends up being the only kind of, other than Michael Myers, the only kind of constant throughout the whole series after that. He's in, I think, all the sequels all up until he dies. Yeah. 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 So then let, let's go into the f- the actual, the very few murder scenes that we get. I mean, how many people die in this movie altogether? Probably about five. Yeah. Yeah, about five. Um, the first murder we see a great deal into the movie. So by this point, it's Halloween night. You've got Laurie Strode babysitting uh, Tommy on one side of the street, and you've got Annie babysitting Lindsay, Lindsay. on the other side of the street. Um, and Who Lindsay then... mugs Annie off so well when she's <laughs> she like, does. "Don't tell him I got shut in the window." And she's like, "Hey, Annie says she got shut in the window." Yeah, I know. <laughs> Amazing. Brilliant. Lindsay's brilliant. So much yeah, sass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so much sass. Yeah, <laughs> and she sits there watching the thing and just ignoring them all most of the time. <laughs> she's like, well. "I just want to watch a film." Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. like, "I'm scared, but I want to watch it anyway." Yeah. Like, Aren't we all? It's, it's yeah. how we all feel. At exactly. That point. Exactly. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, so then you've got Annie's death scene. What a scene! Yeah. The whole, the whole moment where. You kind of you're going through the same thinking process yeah. that Annie is. The door's locked in the car. She tries to get in the car. Door's yeah. locked. Oh, I need to get the keys. Goes in to get the keys. And it's a long sequence. It's a long sequence. Her, go all the way back. All to the, the way house. in. You're like, oh god, when's he gonna hit? When's he gonna pounce? When's he gonna pounce? She's whistling away. Yeah. She comes back. Doesn't unlock the car door. No, she's got the keys. Just opens the car. It's unlocked all of a sudden. Yeah, and you're like, what? and you and and you don't even think about it. She gets in, and then when she thinks, then there's the moment. Hold on, you think and. Boom. It is so well executed, and you're right, you know, you don't think about it. You're so busy worrying that the whole time when she walks back into the house, right. she's going to get pounced on at some yeah. point. That then when she gets into the car, you forget by that point. Yeah. And then there's that bit when she sees them, the windows are all misted up because somebody's in there breathing. Mm. And then by the time you have time to process all that, it's happened, My doesn't it? It's strikes. so good. And there's that big loud chord. <laughs> really really good and again really um quite restrained in terms of how graphic it is as well i think you see it kind of through the misty window from the outside don't you and you're thinking because he's 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 i think he's he's strangling her for quite a while and you're thinking he's he's not he's killing her but he's not as bloodthirsty no. as as uh, Loomis has made out that he is, but then the knife strikes, yeah, and then again it. you don't see it, but that's it, that's all you need to see the action yeah. of the knife kind of plunging. Yeah, yeah, really, it's it's a it's a really it's a scary moment. It actually. is. Yeah. It's a real real effective kill. Definitely, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, definitely. And then you've got the next scene you get is what kind of feels like the absolute classic quintessential slasher sequence you've ever seen. Really, it's yeah. the, it's the sequence that sparks everything. It feels like this is the one that you literally see characters watching in Scream where they're like oh here it comes here it comes comes. yeah Uh, you've got and now Linda (laughs) Linda you've got Linda uh, Linda and Bob Bob. um, and they and they rock up at the house where Annie is babysitting and she's just been been murdered Mm. Annie had been murdered she's just been murdered we don't know where she is at this point Linda walks in and is like oh it's totally dark where is everyone and that, that, that's it and then they go straight upstairs and decide to have sex I they, wonder if they knew which bed to, which bed to go in, in. Yeah. I mean they were like okay well look we know that Laurie's now looking after Lindsay <laughs> we don't know where Annie is but we'll worry about her after the deed uh, uh, let's just go in any bed it's just it's yeah it's ridiculous and also why are all these names so similar so you've got Laurie <laughs> Lindsay Annie Linda. Uh, and Linda yeah very confusing and Bob Tommy, Tommy yeah, yeah. Um, so then you've got this class classic moment where you've got two teens they're misbehaving they're doing all the things they shouldn't be you've got this promiscuous girl she's having sex with a boyfriend in a strange dark house mm. they have sex in what feels like about six seconds yeah it's a, it's a record it's he's, he's <laughs> yeah he's really outdone himself there um but but then it's so funny because afterwards they're like oh god you know like light up a cigarette <laughs> don't they it's so funny um and then there's this moment where obviously she's like why don't you go get me a beer and he says i'll be right back yeah and it's just, again it's like every trope in your head you can imagine it's mm-hmm. like almost like watching scary movie it except is. that it's it's not you know and it is genuinely creepy go get me a beer i thought you were gonna get me one yeah 
I'll be right back. Don't get dressed. And then you've got this death, which, you know, Michael Blythe said a few weeks ago is his favourite, is the best slasher movie death. And it's not necessarily the one everyone remembers as being the goriest or most extreme, but just in terms of the way it's shot and lit and it's, built. The, 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 the lighting in that scene is unreal. Yeah. And it's something that obviously I, I, I didn't appreciate when I was a 13 year old kid. Yeah. But now upon every rewatch, it's just like, what a, like, again, for a horror film to have yeah. a shot such as this. And like a, a kill scene as well. It's yeah. just admirable. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I watched it, um, rewatched it last night and I watched it with Rihanna who was on the podcast last week and she hadn't seen it in ages either. You said she was very scared. She was very scared. It was really funny. <laughs> to begin with, she was all like, oh, 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 yeah, I've seen this a million times, whatever. <laughs> By about halfway through, she was like, I need to go to the toilet and I need you to walk me to the toilet <laughs> and I had to go with her we I love to hear that um, Halloween's nailing it. It, it it really does it sneaks up on you because even I feel very jaded these days but even I felt the, the shivers at some point and also there was a moment we were watching it where it had all the lights off in the house as you should and then uh, there was a moment when our security light outside our front window came on a really cr- tense moment like this moment and we both freaked out and I had to <laughs> I kind of peeped through the curtains to see what it was and it was a fox so it was fine um, but it was like a classic kind of scare moment from a horror film um, but but yeah even she she watched this moment and was first of all terrified and then was like that's a really cool shot yeah. and it is it looks yeah. amazing these kind of silhouettes in front of this blue moonlight as Michael Myers kind of looks at his handiwork and sort of tilts his head from one side to the other it's yeah. brilliant and the di- again the di- it's, it's got to come down to the direction just amazing he yeah. just knew what he wanted to do and he knew that years on me and you would be in this room <laughs> talking about you know what I mean like he, I, he, I think he he just had, had well, I mean across all his films but he just this film especially he just had an eye that, that he knew he was not going to make a horror film he was going to make a bloody good film yeah yeah and and again no gore really in no. this you know you, you do have a man stabbed but it's it's not about that is it it's not and that's what I find so interesting because I think the slasher is so synonymous now with blood and guts yeah. and this quintessential slasher isn't that at all it's, no. it's yeah it's, it's like it's like what you don't see and what you think you do see yeah through what you're not seeing and of course is- exactly and it all comes down to the, probably the fact that he had no money to show stuff mm. but obviously that helped I think that was a huge plus completely um, and then and then he goes upstairs with a sheet I mean why Michael Myers decided to do this put a sheet on with a pair of glasses over it <laughs> it's amazing this is what I, again it's like the question is like what okay I mean <laughs> Cute, Bob, real cute. She knew it would be screwing with her, yeah. like the plant pot with Annie. And that's what I like about Michael. He's got this weird, not playful, but he just knows that he's he's going to confuse people or yeah. whatever, you know, people. He just wants to build it up to this stage where at the last minute they're like, holy shit, you're not who I thought you were. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And it's, and it's kind of like, because he's such an anonymous presence, it doesn't matter. Whatever his actions are, you can believe them because you don't really know what he is or what he does. Yeah. So when he puts a sheet over his head, it's not like you'd go, oh, he would never do that because you don't know what he is or what he would do. You yeah. know, he's just this, he can be anything in this film, basically. Yeah. Can't he? He's just whatever that particular teenager's worst nightmare is in a way. You Completely. Know? All right, Annie. First I get your famous chewing, now I get your famous squealing. <laughs> So this is it. We get to the final act, basically, and and there's that brilliant moment when she discovers all the dead bodies, which is still pretty freaky. It's such a great scene, like yeah. how, like a real house of horrors. It's like a ghost <laughs> exactly train. That. It's exactly a ghost that. train, you know. Yeah. And it's it, absolutely it's that. That's when I don't think that scares me so much. I just find it really fun. Yes, that scene. Each time I watch it, just seeing preempting what's going to happen, seeing her react, seeing the reaction. Yeah, it's brilliant. There's something kind of creepy about. The girl who's lying on the bed with the Judith Myers grave behind her is, yeah. is kind of creepy. The way that he's kind of displayed it is, is yeah. weird. Yeah. And again, what I, what I love about that is that it's, it's um, it, I forgot about, I always forget about this scene yeah. where um, Loomis goes to the graves That's and right. then Judith Myers' uh, body's gone yeah. and it's yeah. been dug yeah. up. Um, and then later you kind of forget that's happened and then when you see it you're like oh god it all clicks into place in this scene really this is like the one where it all ties together and again it's that idea of like so he had this plan like he he planned all this out for some reason he deliberately (laughs) somehow knows how to drive he drove to this graveyard dug up the body and gravestone of his sister then drove to this house and planted everything (laughs) like it's so weird you're just going what the hell is this man and what does what's he doing how is he managing why has it got anything to do with Jamie Lee Curtis and why is he displaying all this for her you know it's just absolutely baffling but terrifying 
and it is like a nightmare it's like a nightmarish vision yes yeah, so so good um and then you have this whole kind of prolonged chase sequence screaming running around the streets a really i think creepy moment is when she's knocking on the neighbor's doors and they're kind of shutting the blinds and ignoring her while she's screaming Horrible. i find it, it like you say that like, this is for me the most nightmarish sequence and yeah. i it's it's something that you can imagine having a nightmare about yourself yes where you just want you're screaming for help and no one's coming yes and and he's just you know Michael Myers is coming after you or whoever is coming after you and even when she's trying to wake up Tommy yeah. she's throwing out and then he's he's just like being really unresponsive and being really slow and she's screaming I think this is a kind of very very well trodden formula in, the, in yeah. these days in films and you know they're going to get away with them in this film I always I'm always still not sure she's going to get away oh, it's amazing you know? and it's that it's that like quintessential thing of being a teenager where you're she's old enough where she is in charge of children but she still she still wants help from adults like yeah. she's still not a complete grown up herself so you see her being this quite authoritative figure throughout the film where she's looking after these kids and she's responsible for these kids lives but also she just wants some fucking help from a grown up and no one will give it to her yeah. and she's on her own you know it's like a horrible kind of she's the teenagers are in that kind of in between spot aren't they that's a really yeah. good point hello Basically, it's like Laurie versus Michael now, isn't it? Again and again, where she keeps stabbing him with knitting, knitting, needles, knitting needles and she thinks he's dead and then he isn't. And again, the only thing that really frustrates me about this, and it's supposed to be frustrating, I know, is that it's like, don't fucking drop the knife and relax no, just because you've stabbed him and she's just sl- lying back on the sofa. She's slouching back, back to him. It's like, he just tried <laughs> stabbing you with that knife, you know? He's every, down, like, come on. I know, every time she thinks she's killed him, she decides to sit somewhere where he's directly he's behind, behind her. her. <laughs> I mean, you'd either like, you'd either, what would you do? Like, you'd either, I think that was just like, what would I do? It's like, I can, like, you'd, you'd, it's easy to say, well, you'd kill him or you'd, mm. you'd stab him again or whatever. It's like, yes. well, actually, I don't think Laurie would do No, that. absolutely. Rihanna said that to me. She was like, just behead him now. I'm like, <laughs> nah, come on. Like, if a real intruder came into your house, would you think, let's, let's behead him? Of course you wouldn't. <laughs> you'd think if he was unconscious, though, I think I would turn on all the lights. I'd stand maybe outside the front door on the porch. Yeah. But look through the window where I can see him, but be a safe distance away. Yeah. And then scream for help. And scream or for help. Yeah. You know? Remind me not to cross Rihanna. Like, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Just behead yeah. him. Yeah. Whoever it is, just cut his head off. <laughs> Again, a huge trope. Characters do stupid things. Mm-hmm. You, you always find yourself shouting at the characters, you know, from this movie onwards, you know, don't do that. Yeah. Um, and even though Laurie is the smartest character, she does some stupid things in this, really in this sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I think is the next bit after that where she's in the cupboard. She's just trapped in the closet right, with him coming closet and he comes after and she's a pretty creepy moment it's insane well. yeah and it's and that's where she gets to hang her right and she's trying yeah. to yeah um, that, it's just that kind of there's nowhere to go yeah she and, and she had all that she kind of had I mean I say vast expanse but she had she could have run anywhere she could have just ran you know down the street she yeah. could have gone to some more houses she could have gone to a, another road altogether yeah. and found someone walking along the street yeah. dog or whatever but no she goes inside the house yeah. she goes inside the cupboard yeah. and it's just restriction you know <laughs> and it's, know. it's, it's that it just kind of really adds to, it intensifies the nightmarish thing yeah. even further and you think it can't even it can't get worse but yeah, it does it does it's exactly and like again later we, down the line we talk about Scream but there's a line when Nev Campbell in Scream says you know those movies are all the same it's always a girl running up the stairs when she should be running out the front, the front door. door and that's always the way yeah. isn't it um, yeah I mean it's just amazing and it's, it's a, that, that is a great moment and then we, again we think he's dead we think there's a kind of relaxing calm the children run to safety she's like run children run and you're, yeah. you're thinking like is he gonna get the children now like, you yeah. just never know it's that kind Kind of. And there's that moment again. He's really brilliantly directed where he's in the background of frame and just sits, sits up, up, sits up. Right. Well, that that's probably the best moment in the film, I think. Yeah. That and she's so unaware, mm-hmm. and you think she's going to get away from him, but mm-hmm. like that, you know, the last minute. And I think in films these days, the character would realize and get away just. Yeah. But Laurie, Laurie doesn't. Like he he gets to her and he grabs her and, and he's he, about to murder. And he's her, about yeah. to murder her. He gets to her, and so when you're watching, you think she's going to get away. And she doesn't. Yeah. It's just like you know this film. Man. Yeah, it's so good. And that is finally then the moment when Sam Loomis or Dr. Loomis becomes useful yes. and actually does the thing we need him to do. He stops talking and he uses his <laughs> weapon and he takes, well, takes Michael out. Takes him out, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and then, of course, there's that final shot when the body is gone. And, you know, then begins a slew of awful sequels. But uh, <laughs> but, but it's a great ending to well, that It's a great ending and I think it's so characteristic. Yeah. Um, uh, it stays in character of the film because it's happened all throughout. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, been yeah. a real, it's a real um, scare tactic mm-hmm. 
in that it, and it's so and it's it's done to death these days but yeah. at the time i mean it, it wasn't it, it was more effective where you see something and you think is that person looking at me and then you look away yeah. and you look back and he's gone yes. and it's just like that, something being gone it's it's so scary yes. you're like where the hell are they yes where is he now where is he now and i love at the ending when it then kind of does this like montage sequence where it cuts to all the different locations oh, yeah. and you hear his breathing and you're like oh he's kind of he's just like it's omnipresent it's so true and 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 by that point you're so used to seeing him somewhere in frame that you're studying every last shot of all those rooms in the houses right. that are all very darkly lit dim shadowy so you're going oh you know where the fuck where is he? the yeah. hell is this guy yeah really and, and and the, the, the um emotion that laurie's showing i always like I, what do you think about it? it's like when he looks over mm-hmm. and he realizes that he's gone um and laurie cries is laurie crying because she realizes that he's gone herself or is mm. laurie crying because of just the traumatic experience that she's had yeah i think it looks like she's read him and realizes uh, he's, he's gone, gone. Yeah, yeah yeah i think so but it's brilliant. And Donald Pleasance does it in kind of two different ways as well. And I remember seeing John Carpenter talk about this, that he, you know, should he act like, oh my God, he's gone shocked, or should he act like, I knew this was going to happen, happen, knowing. And he kind of does both with one look, which is really well done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a great ending. Absolutely smashes really it. Really good. Smashes it. Absolutely smashes, smashes it. it. Everyone smashes it. Everyone smashes it, including Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Inclu- oh, totally. Linda. So the whole film was, I've got some facts here. The whole film took, like, it took 10 days for John Carpenter and Deborah Hill to write it, apparently. Amazing. John Carpenter wrote most of the Dr. Loomis, Michael Myers stuff, and Deborah Hill wrote all of the Teenage Girl stuff, oh, essentially. Cool. They kind of split it. Yeah. Um, and then it was all shot in 20 days in spring in California, so therefore it wasn't autumn. They had to fake the autumn leaves. They kind of dropped them in front of frame by hand, but it was actually shot in springtime. I see. Amazing. It's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, and yeah, I mean, it cost... So it cost a budget of three hundred thousand dollars, and it grossed forty-seven million um, when it first was released in the United States, and then a further thirty million internationally. Uh, yeah, so it became basically, I think, at the time, the biggest independent movie of all time. It was the most profitable movie ever. I think until Blair Witch Project, sort of twenty years you later, think, broke right? that record. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So absolute huge success. Like he had perfected the formula completely. Absolutely nailed it commercially yeah. and just in and. It, and artistically and i think if a film of this caliber was made today it probably wouldn't do as well no. really even like uh four original films is just hard today to break ground and yeah. to to create anything new but there are films out there that are trying to do it and it's yeah, and films it's have done it yeah, yeah definitely i mean it's still it's still a possibility but you get one to one per generation almost it feels mm-hmm. like doesn't it and yeah i mean Blair Witch Project. I'm trying to think if there's anything since then that has been that much of a groundbreaking new format that has, you know, sparked something as much as that has. I don't know. But. I mean, in terms of scares, for, for me, the scariest film I've ever seen is Paranormal Activity. And I yeah. know it's it's one of the things that people... And that kind of followed the format of Blair Witch. In a yeah, way. exactly. And I think yeah. it's Blair Witch did very did scare me very much, but I think it's because I was, I was relatively younger. But Paranormal Activity, I was... You know, like I was, I was 19 years old, yeah. and 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 I saw it in a cinema, and I didn't think I, I was scared, but I wasn't terrified. And yeah. I got back to my room, turned the light off, couldn't sleep. Yeah, probably the yeah. only film I've ever had where that where that's been the case. You know, yeah. it's Halloween. I like falling asleep to Halloween. It's one of them. <laughs> just get into bed, just kind of get a bit cozy, and but for on a horror film, Halloween's that kind of film. Paranormal Activity has similar scare tactics in a way to to Halloween, though, where. What I think is scary about Paranormal Activity and Halloween are those moments when very little is happening, but you find yourself studying every corner of the frame, yeah. waiting for something to happen. You know, with a Paranormal Activity, you're watching a bedroom for what feels like 10 minutes, and the door will slightly swing, and you'll jump out of your skin. Yeah. And with Halloween, it's the same. You're watching a dark corridor for 10 minutes before suddenly Michael Myers' face appears in a window, and, and, and that terrifies you yeah. you know and for me halloween the success of halloween is is the build up i think it's the it's the first hour it's all the tension it's all the michael stalking it's people. the way stalking and just i don't know who said it before just the way he he's screwing with people yeah and it's like just, you said the way he's omnipresent that's yeah it. that's it he's there in every frame and and just i i really love the way he's like kind of like goofing about almost yeah his yeah. His, his really fucked up way of goofing about yeah and they're all so just disturbing. His, his pawns basically yeah you know? and he has complete control over everything like everything is going according to his plan mm. that he planned from the start that he's been planning for 15 years and you're not even sure whatever. how and you're not even sure what that is or how yeah exactly yeah. so you know i think that's the thing with this movie it just takes the time it just takes its time 
time. Mm. That is what's so nice about it. it it's, it's suspense and it's not gore, basically. Yeah. The only thing I would say, I don't think, I'm, I'm one of these few people that thinks it's not as accomplished as Black Christmas that came four years before it, which to my mind does all the things we've you talked about. Black Christmas. I just love it. Yeah. I think it's like just the most underrated gem. And I think... Black Christmas does all those things that Halloween did, but also it does it with better actors, better characters, and better writing, personally. I don't think maybe that the direction uh, and the cinematography is quite as good as Carpenter's, and obviously Mm -hmm. it's not got as good a score, but I think the actual story, the characters, you can get behind more, and I care more. But Halloween is absolutely incredible. Like, you just can't, you can't deny it. Like, I rewatched it again for what must be the, like, 10th or 12th time I've seen it, and it's still, there are still new things I spot there are still things that take me by surprise. There are still things that scare me. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's just so easy as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, above all else, it's just a very easy film to watch. It, it, it absolutely tears along. Yeah. Uh, such a such a pace. Yeah. And before you know it's finished, it's so well uh, structured. Yeah. I do think it's a perfect horror film. And I, I, I'm so happy that I've got to, to revisit it and, yeah. and kind of go in depth on this film. Absolutely. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Well, before we finish, I'm going to ask you a few little silly questions that I ask everyone. Okay? Sure. So you've already said what your favourite horror movie is. It is Halloween, is it? Halloween is my favourite horror movie. Um, I also have a lot, a lot of love for um, Rosemary's Baby. Oh, good choice. Yeah. Absolutely love Again, Rosemary's just that Baby. nightmarish... Uh, I. It's just nightmarish um, with witches thrown in mm-hmm. is, for me, a real no-no. Like, witch, witchcraft terrifies the hell out of me. Yeah, yeah This is yeah. why, like, I they're not great films, but the remainder of the um, Paranormal Activity franchise, yes. when they started throwing witchcraft yeah. in and um, just like a coven yes. of witches randomly in final scenes or, or, or whatever, I um, yeah. it would terrify the hell out of me. But, um, yeah, I absolutely love Rosemary's Baby so much. If only... For those performances, oh, Ruth Gordon. Just, oh my god, absolutely amazing! They're yeah, incredible. I'm with you on covens and cults. Freak me out. Anything yeah. about cults scares me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the Wicker Man always freaks me out like, as well. It's, it's, it's that feeling of like everyone is against you and nobody believes you. Yeah. it's that horrible thing of like you're completely alone. Yeah, uh, good choice. It's yeah, horrible. Um, scariest movie you've ever seen? What's the What's the film that scared you the most? So I, I, I I've touched on this before. Paranormal Activity. Yes. was the only film that's kind of given me sleepless a sleepless night. <laughs> Um, I find I found it so. Uh, I mean, I don't. I think it's a great film. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I don't love the film per se. It just the scares really got to me. I really hate the idea of kind of being with a person that you love and that you trust, but yet when you're at your most vulnerable when you're asleep, yes. you know something else is going on altogether. Yeah. And I love and I love the analogy you you made between Halloween and paranormal activity and mm. like it's almost like in many ways. The, the demon mm. that is after Katie is is like Michael in the way he's trying to mess with her, yeah, mess with yeah, Mika. Yeah. Um, so that's what scared me. But one film, that recent film that chilled me to the bone mm. was um, The Witch. Oh, me too. I'm so glad you said that because so many people just didn't get The Witch I or hated it. It absolutely chilled me to the bone as well. I think that's one of them films that you literally take, if you took any shot from that film and put it, in a frame, on a wall, yeah. and you looked at it, you'd shudder. Yes. And yeah, like, how is it that just shots of that guy just chopping wood were terrifying, but they all were, it, you know? Uh, it was... It's so scary. Yeah. And it's one of, like, the, the score oh. in that film. Yeah. Again, it, I mean, I, th- I think we're noticing a theme here. I think without the score of Halloween, I don't know if I would love the film half as much no, as I do, and I think the same has to, be, has to be said for The Witch. I'm right there with you, especially with The Witch. It's, it's there... It's as I've gotten older. It's it's for me. It's less about the jumps and it's more about that dread. It's more about that like eerie uncanniness. Completely. That the witch is totally that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, all right, perfect. Well, I think that's that's. We, I mean, we've covered everything we've you possibly can about everything. Halloween. Have we, we really have? Thank you so so much for Mate, joining me. Thank Jacob. you. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, where where can people find you if they want to like read your writing or if they want to follow you on social media? Oh, give well, us the deets. if you want to follow me on social media, it's uh, Jacob underscore Stoll, which is S T O L. First four letters of my very long surname <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you can find me on The Independence uh, where I invariably write reviews featured and interviews I'll be covering The Walking Dead season 8 for Brilliant. anyone who's a fan of that I'll be up through the night so anyone who would like to read along please do <laughs> to make it feel like it's worth it uh, but yeah other than that I, I'm I'm around excellent you're around, always around I'm in the pub <laughs> yeah. you're like Michael Myers you're omnipresent omnipresent but yeah. usually in a pub window <laughs> with a pint in my hand <laughs> 
And that is it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much to my brilliant guests, Chris Hewitt and Jacob Stolworthy. I think between us all, we pretty much covered everything there is to cover with John Carpenter's Halloween. So I hope that was sufficient for all you Halloween fans out there. Um, Don't forget, Chris also hosts the fantastic Empire podcast, the biggest and best movie podcast in the world. You can find that on all major podcast platforms. And Jacob Stolworthy, among many other things, writes for The Independent. So do check out theindependent.co.uk to find articles that he has written. Now, don't forget, if you want to get in touch with us, you can email evolutionofhorror at gmail.com or you can tweet at evolutionpod. If you want to find me personally, I can be found on Twitter at the movie Mike, And I also do another podcast with Rihanna Dillon, who joined me for Black Christmas last week. And our podcast is called Back Row. You can find that at Back Row Films. And Back Row Podcast is also available on iTunes. Now... Next week, we are finally into the 1980s. This is where the slasher boom really happened. Um, But what we're going to cover next week is one of the more commercially mainstream slasher movies. In fact, it starred Michael Caine, and it was directed by an already established auteur director by this point, the brilliant Brian De Palma. I am, of course, talking about that controversial 1980 slasher movie, Dressed to Kill. To discuss Dress to Kill and all things Brian De Palma, I'm going to be joined by a fantastic journalist, presenter, critic, host. He's the TV critic for Heat magazine and he also presents the Heat Unmissables podcast. I am, of course, talking about the fantastic Boyd Hilton. Join me next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. 